to my parents, for taking us to the lake. And to Bob, for letting me go back. 1. Now. The fourth cocktail had seemed like a good idea. So did the bangs, come to think of it. But now that I'm struggling to unlock my apartment door, I'm guessing I might regret that last spritz in the morning. Maybe the bangs, too. June told me breakup bangs were almost always a very bad choice when I sat in her chair for a cut today. But June wasn't going to her friend's engagement celebration, newly single, that night. Bangs were in order. It's not that I'm still in love with my ex, I'm not. I never was. Sebastian is kind of a snob. An up-and-coming corporate lawyer, he wouldn't have lasted one hour at Chantal's party without scoffing at her choice of signature drink and referencing some pretentious article he read in the New York Times that declared Aperol spritzes over. Instead, he would pretend to study the wine list, ask the bartender annoying questions about terroir and acidity and, regardless of the answers, go with a glass of the most expensive red. It's not that he has exceptional taste or knows a lot about wine, he doesn't. He just buys expensive stuff to give the impression of being discerning. Sebastian and I were together for seven months, giving our relationship the distinction of being my longest-lasting one yet. In the end, he said he didn't really know who I was. And he had a point. Before Sebastian, the guys I picked were up for a good time and didn't seem to mind keeping things casual. By the time I met him, I figured being a serious adult meant I should find someone to get serious about. Sebastian fit the bill. He was attractive, well-read, and successful, and despite being a bit pompous, he could talk to anyone about almost anything. But I still found it hard to share too many pieces of myself. I'd long ago learned to tamp down my tendency to let random thoughts spew unfiltered from my mouth. I thought I was doing a good job of giving the relationship a real chance, but in the end Sebastian recognized my indifference, and he was right. I didn't care about him. I didn't care about any of them. There was only the one. And that one is long gone. So I enjoy spending time with men, and I appreciate how sex gives me an escape ladder out of my mind. I like making men laugh, I like having company, I like taking a break from my vibrator once in a while, but I don't get attached, and I don't go deep. I'm still fumbling with my key seriously, is something wrong with the lock, when my phone buzzes in my purse. Which is weird. No one calls me this late. Actually, no one ever calls me, except for Chantal and my parents. But Chantal is still at her party and my parents are touring Prague and won't be awake yet. The buzzing stops just as I get the door open and stumble into my small one-bedroom apartment. I check the mirror by the entrance to find my lipstick mostly smudged off but my bangs looking pretty phenomenal. Suck it, June. I begin to unfasten the strappy gold sandals I'm wearing, a dark sheet of hair falling over my face, when my phone starts up again. I dig it out of my purse and, one shoe off, make my way toward the couch, frowning at the unknown name message on the screen. Probably a wrong number. Hello? I ask, bending to take off the second sandal. Is this Percy? I stand upright so fast I have to hold on to the arm of the couch to steady myself. Percy. It's a name nobody calls me anymore. These days I'm Persephone to almost everyone. Sometimes I'm P. But I'm never Percy. I haven't been Percy for years. Hello. Percy? The voice is deep and soft. It's one I haven't heard in more than a decade, but so familiar I'm suddenly 13 years old and slathered in SPF 45, reading paperbacks on the dock. I'm 16 and peeling off my clothes to jump into the lake, naked and sticky after a shift at the tavern. I'm 17 and lying on Sam's bed in a damp bathing suit, watching his long fingers move across the anatomy textbook he's studying by my feet. Blood rushes hot to my face with a whoosh, and the steady, thick pumping of my heart invades my eardrums. I take a shaky breath and sit, stomach muscle seizing. Yes, I manage, and he lets out a long, 
relieved sounding breath. It's Charlie. Charlie. Not Sam. Charlie. The wrong brother. Charles Florek, Charlie clarifies, and begins explaining how he tracked down my number, something about a friend of a friend and a connection at the magazine where I work, but I'm barely listening. Charlie? I interrupt. My voice is high-pitched and tight, one part spritz and two parts shock. Or maybe all parts total disappointment. Because this voice does not belong to Sam. But of course it doesn't. I know, I know. It's been a long time. God, I don't even know how long, he says, and it sounds like an apology. But I do. I know exactly how long. I keep count. It's been twelve years since I've seen Charlie. Twelve years since that catastrophic Thanksgiving weekend when everything between Sam and me fell apart. When I tore everything apart. I used to count the number of days until my family would head up to the cottage so I could see Sam again. Now here's a painful memory I keep hidden deep beneath my ribs. I also know I've gone more years without Sam than I spent with him. The Thanksgiving that marked seven years since I'd spoken to him, I had a panic attack, my first in ages, then drank my way through a bottle and a half of rosé. It felt monumental, I'd officially been without him for more years than we'd had together at the lake. I'd cried in ugly, heaving sobs on the bathroom tiles until I passed out. Chantal came over the next day with greasy takeout and held my hair back as I puked, tears streaming down my face, and I told her everything. It's been forever, I tell Charlie. I know. And I'm sorry to call you so late, he says. He sounds so much like Sam it hurts, as if there's a lump of dough lodged in my throat. I remember when we were 14 and it was almost impossible to tell him apart from Charlie on the phone. I remember noticing other things about Sam that summer, too. Listen, P.E.R.S. I'm calling with some news, he says, using the name he used to call me but sounding much more serious than the Charlie I once knew. I hear him breathe in through his nose. Mom passed away a few days ago, and I, well, I thought you'd want to know. His words slam into me like a tsunami, and I struggle to fully understand them. Sue's dead? Sue was young. All I can get out is a ragged sounding what? Charlie sounds exhausted when he replies. Cancer. She'd been fighting it for a couple of years. We're devastated, of course, but she was sick of being sick, you know? And not for the first time, it feels like someone stole the script to my life story and wrote it all wrong. It seems impossible that Sue was sick. Sue, with her big smile and her denim cutoffs and her white blonde ponytail. Sue, who made the best peerages in the universe. Sue, who treated me like a daughter. Sue, who I dreamed one day might be a mother-in-law to me. Sue, who was sick for years without me knowing. I should have known. I should have been there. I'm so, so sorry, I begin. I. I don't know what to say. Your mom was, she was. I sound panicked, I can hear it. Hold it together, I tell myself. You lost rights to Sue a long time ago. You are not allowed to fall apart right now. I think about how Sue raised two boys on her own while running the tavern, and about the first time I met her, when she came over to the cottage to assure my much older parents that Sam was a good kid and that she would keep an eye on us. I remember when she taught me how to hold three plates at once and the time she told me not to take crap from any boy, including her own two sons. She was everything. I say. She was such a good mom. She was. And I know she meant a lot to you when we were kids. That's sort of why I'm calling, says Charlie, tentative. Her funeral is on Sunday. I know it's been a long time, but I think you should be there. Will you come? A long time? It's been twelve years. Twelve years since I've made the drive north to the place that was more like home to me than anywhere else has been. Twelve years since I dove, head first, 
into the lake. Twelve years since my life crashed spectacularly off course. Twelve years since I've seen Sam. But there's only one answer. Of course I will. 2. Summer, 17 years ago. I don't think my parents knew when they bought the cottage that two adolescent boys lived in the house next door. Mom and Dad wanted to give me an escape from the city, a break from other kids my age, and the Florek boys, who went unsupervised for long stretches of the afternoons and evenings, were probably as big a surprise to them as they were to me. A few of the kids in my class had summer homes, but they were all in Muskoka, just a short drive north from the city, where the word cottage didn't seem quite right for the waterfront mansions that lined the area's rocky shores. Dad flat out refused to look in Muskoka. He said if we bought a cottage there, we might as well stay in Toronto for the summer, it was too close to the city and too full of Torontonians. So he and Mom focused their search on rural communities further northeast, which Dad declared too developed or too overpriced, and then further still until finally they settled on Barry's Bay, a sleepy, working-class village that transformed into a bustling tourist town in the summer, sidewalks bursting with cottages and European sightseers on their way to camp or hike in Algonquin Provincial Park. You'll love it there, kiddo, he promised. It's the real cottage country. I would eventually look forward to the four-hour drive from our Tudor in midtown Toronto to the lake, but that first trip spanned an eternity. Entire civilizations rose and fell by the time we passed the welcome to Barry's Bay sign, Dad and I in the moving truck and Mom following behind in the Lexus. Unlike Mom's car, the truck had neither a decent sound system nor air conditioning, and I was stuck listening to the monotonous hum of CBC radio, the backs of my thighs glued to the vinyl bench and my bangs plastered to my clammy forehead. Almost all the girls in my seventh grade class got bangs after Delilah Mason did though they didn't suit the rest of us as well. Delilah was the most popular girl in our grade, and I considered myself lucky to be one of her closest friends. Or at least I used to, but that was before the sleepover incident. Her bangs formed a neat red valance over her forehead while mine defied both gravity and styling products, jutting out in odd poofs and angles, making me look every bit the awkward 13-year-old I was, rather than the mysterious dark-eyed brunette I wanted to be. My hair was neither straight nor curly and seemed to change its personality based on an unpredictable number of factors, from the day of the week to the weather to the way I slept the night before. Whereas I would do anything I could to make people like me, my hair refused to fall in line. Winding down Tichy Bushland on the western shore of Kamaniskeg Lake, Bear Rock Lane was a narrow dirt road that lived up to its name. The drive Dad turned down was so overgrown that branches scraped the sides of the small truck. Smell that, kiddo. Dad asked, rolling down his window as we bumped along in the truck. Together we inhaled deeply, and the scent of long-fallen pine needles filled my nostrils, earthy and medicinal. We pulled up to the back door of a modest wood A-frame cabin that was dwarfed by the white and red pines that grew around it. Dad shut off the engine and turned to me a smile below his graying mustache and eyes crinkling under dark-rimmed glasses, and said, Welcome to the lake, Persephone. The cottage had this incredible smoky wood smell. Somehow it never faded, even after years of mom burning her expensive diptyque candles. Each time I returned, I'd stand at the entrance, breathing it in, just like I did that first day. The main floor was a small open space, covered floor to ceiling in pale planks of knotted wood. Massive windows opened onto an almost obnoxiously stunning view of the lake. Wow, I murmured, spotting a staircase leading from the deck and down a steep hill. Not bad, huh? Dad patted me on the shoulder. I'm going to check out the water, I said, already darting out the side door, which closed behind me with an enthusiastic thwack. I fled down dozens of steps until I reached the dock. It was a humid afternoon, every inch of sky carpeted by thick grey clouds that were mirrored in the still, silver water below. I could barely make out the cottages that dotted the far shore. I wondered if I could swim across it. I sat on the edge of the dock, legs dangling in the water, shocked at how quiet it was, until mom yelled down for me to help unpack. 
We were tired and cranky from moving boxes and fighting off mosquitoes by the time we unloaded the truck. I left mom and dad to get the kitchen organized and headed upstairs. There were two bedrooms, my parents forfeited the lakeside one to me, saying that since I spent more time in my room, I'd make better use of the view. I unpacked my clothes, made the bed, and folded a Hudson's Bay blanket at the end. Dad didn't think we needed such heavy wool blankets in summer, but mom insisted on having one for each bed. It's Canadiana, she explained in a tone that said that should have been obvious. I arranged a perilously high stack of paperbacks on one nightstand and tacked up a creature from the Black Lagoon poster above the bed. I had a thing for horror. I watched a ton of scary movies, my parents having long ago given up on censoring them, and hoovered classic Arl Stein and Christopher Pike books, as well as newer series about hot teens who turned into werewolves during full moons and hot teens who hunted ghosts after cheerleading practice. Back when I still had friends, I'd bring the books to school and read the good bits, as in anything gory or remotely sexy, aloud. At first, I just loved getting a reaction from the girls, loved being the center of attention but with the safety net of someone else's words as the entertainment. But the more horror I read, the more I grew to love the writing behind the story, how the authors made impossible situations believable. I liked how each book was both predictable and unique, comforting and unexpected. Safe but never boring. Pizza for dinner? Mom stood at the doorway, eyeing the poster but saying nothing. They have pizza? Barry's Bay Haddon looked big enough to have delivery. And, it turned out, it wasn't, so we drove to the takeout only pizza pizza, located in a corner of one of the town's two grocery stores. How many people live here? I asked Mom. It was 7 p.m., and most of the businesses on the main drag looked closed. About 1,200, though I expect it's probably triple that in the summer with all the cottages, she said. With the exception of a crowded restaurant patio, the town was pretty much deserted. The tavern must be the place to be on a Saturday night, she commented, slowing down as we passed. It looks like it's the only place to be, I replied. By the time we got back, Dad had the small TV set up. There was no cable, but we had packed our family DVD collection. I was thinking the great outdoors, said Dad. Seems appropriate, don't you think, kiddo? Hum. I crouched down to inspect the contents of the cabinet. The Blair Witch Project would also be appropriate. I'm not watching that, Mom said, setting out plates and napkins next to the pizza boxes on the coffee table. The great outdoors it is, said Dad, popping it into the player. Classic John Candy. What could be better? The wind had picked up outside, moving through the pine boughs, and waves were now traveling across the lake's surface. The breeze coming through the window smelled like rain. Yeah, I said, taking a bite of my slice. This is actually pretty great. A bolt of lightning zigged through the sky, illuminating the pines and the lake and the hills of the far shore, like someone had taken a flash photo with a giant camera. I watched the storm, transfixed, from my bedroom windows. The view was so much bigger than the wedge of sky I could see from my room in Toronto, the thunder so loud it seemed to be right above the cottage, as though it had been custom ordered for our first night. Eventually the deafening claps faded into distant rumbles, and I slipped back into bed, listening to the rain pelting the windows. Mom and Dad were already downstairs when I woke the next morning, momentarily confused by the bright sun coming through the windows and ripples of light moving across the ceiling. They sat, coffees at the ready, reading materials in hand, Dad in the armchair with an issue of The Economist, scratching his beard absent-mindedly, and Mom on a stool at the kitchen counter, flipping through a thick design magazine, her oversized red-framed glasses balancing on the tip of her nose. Hear that thunder last night, kiddo? Dad asked. Kinda hard to miss, I said, grabbing a box of cereal from the still mostly empty cupboards. I don't think I got a lot of sleep. After breakfast, I filled a canvas tote with supplies, a novel, a couple of magazines, lip balm, and a tube of SPF 45 and headed down to the lake. 
Though it had poured the night before, the dock was already dry from the morning sun. I placed my towel down and slathered sunscreen all over my face, then lay on my stomach, face propped on my hands. There wasn't another dock for maybe another 150 meters on one side, but the one in the other direction was relatively close. There was a rowboat tied to it and a raft floating further out from shore. I pulled out my paperback and picked up from where I left off the night before. I must have fallen asleep because I was suddenly jerked awake by a loud splash and the sound of boys yelling and laughing. I'll get you, one shouted. Like you could, a deeper voice taunted. Splash! Two heads bobbed in the lake next to the neighbor's raft. Still lying on my belly, I watched them climb onto the raft, taking turns launching themselves off in flips and dives and flops. It was early July, but they were both bronzed already. I guessed they were brothers and that the smaller, skinny one was probably close to my age. The older boy stood ahead above him, shadows hinting at lean muscles running along his torso and arms. When he tossed the younger one over his shoulder into the water, I sat up laughing. They hadn't noticed me until then, but now the older boy stood looking in my direction with a big smile across his face. The smaller one climbed up on the raft beside him. Hey, the older boy shouted with a wave. Hi! I yelled back. New neighbor, he called over. Yeah, I hollered. The younger boy stood staring until the older one shoved his shoulder. Jesus, Sam. Say hi. Sam raised his hand and stared at me before the older boy pushed him back into the lake. It took eight hours for the Florek boys to find me. I was sitting on the deck with my book after washing the dinner dishes when I heard a knock at the back door. I strained my neck but couldn't see who mom was talking to, so I tucked my bookmark into the pages and pushed myself out of the folding chair. We saw a girl on your dock earlier today and wanted to come say hi. The voice belonged to a teenage boy, deepish but young sounding. My brother doesn't have anyone his age nearby to play with. Play? I'm not a baby, a second boy replied, his words cracking in irritation. Mom looked at me over her shoulder, eyes narrowed in question. You've got visitors, Persephone, she said, making it clear she wasn't exactly pleased about that fact. I stepped outside and closed the screen door behind me, looking up at the tawny-haired boys I'd seen swimming earlier in the day. They were clearly related, both lanky and tanned, but their differences were just as plain. Whereas the older boy was smiling wide, scrubbed clean and clearly knew his way around a bottle of styling gel, the younger one was staring at his feet, a wavy tangle of hair falling haphazardly over his eyes. He wore baggy cargo shorts and a faded Weezer t-shirt that was at least one size too big, the older boy was dressed in jeans, a fitted white crew neck and black converse, the rubber toes perfectly white. Hi, Persephone, I'm Charlie, the bigger one said, with deep dimples and celery green eyes dancing across my face. Cute. Boy band cute. And this is my brother, Sam. He put his hand on the younger boy's shoulder. Sam gave me a reluctant half-grin from under a swish of hair, then looked down again. I figured he was tall for his age, but all that length made him gangly, his arms and legs twiggy sticks, and his elbows and knees sharp as jagged rocks. His feet looked like tripping hazards. Ah, hey, I started, looking between them. I think I saw you guys down at the lake today. Yep, that was us, said Charlie while Sam kicked at pine needles. We live next door. Like, all the time? I asked, giving oxygen to the first thought that came into my head. Year round, he confirmed. We're from Toronto, so this, I said, waving around at the surrounding bush, is pretty new for me. You're lucky to live here. Sam snorted at that, but Charlie went on, ignoring him. Well, Sam and I would be happy to show you around. Wouldn't we, Sam, he asked his brother, not pausing for the answer. And you're welcome to use our raft anytime. We don't mind, he said, still smiling. 
He spoke with the confidence of an adult. Cool. I definitely will, thanks. I gave him a shy smile back. Listen, I have a favor to ask you, said Charlie conspiratorially. Sam groaned from under his mop of sandy hair. Some friends of mine are coming by tonight, and I thought Sam could hang out with you here while they're over. He doesn't have much of a social life, and you look about the same age, he said, giving me a once-over. I'm 13, I replied, glancing at Sam to see if he had an opinion on this proposal, but he was still examining the ground. Or maybe his submarine-sized feet. Pear effect, Charlie purred. Sam's 13, too. I'm 15, he added proudly. Congratulations, Sam muttered. Charlie continued, anyway, Persephone. Percy, I interrupted with a burst. Charlie gave me a funny look. I laughed nervously and spun the friendship bracelet I wore around my wrist, explaining, it's Percy. Persephone is too much name. And a bit pretentious. Sam straightened up and looked at me then, scrunching his eyebrows and nose momentarily. His face was kind of ordinary, no feature especially memorable, except for his eyes, which were a shocking shade of sky blue. Percy it is, Charlie agreed, but my attention was still on Sam, who watched me with his head tilted. Charlie cleared his throat. So as I was saying, you'd be doing me a huge favor if you'd entertain my little brother for the evening. Jesus, Sam whispered at the same time I asked, entertain. We blinked at each other. I shifted my weight on my feet, not sure what to say. It had been months since I defended Delilah Mason so fantastically that I no longer had any friends, months since I'd spent time with someone my age, but the last thing I wanted was for Sam to be forced to hang out with me. Before I could say so, he spoke up. You don't have to if you don't want. He sounded apologetic. He's just trying to get rid of me because mom's not home. Charlie belted him across the chest. The truth was I wanted a friend more than I wanted my bangs to behave. If Sam was willing, I could use the company. I don't mind, I told him, adding with false confidence, I mean, it is a huge imposition. So you can show me how to do one of those somersaults off the raft as payback. He gave me a lopsided grin. It was a quiet smile, but it was a great smile, his blue eyes glinting like sea glass against his sunny skin. I did that, I thought, a thrill running through me. I wanted to do it again. 3. Now. My teenage self wouldn't believe it, but I don't own a car. Back then, I was determined to have my own set of wheels so I could head north every weekend possible. These days, my life is confined to a leafy area in Toronto's West End, where I live, and the city's downtown core, where I work. I can get to the office, the gym, and my parents' condo by either walking or public transit. I have friends who haven't ever bothered getting their license, they are the kind of people who brag about never going north of Bloor Street. Their whole world is confined to a stylish little urban bubble, and they're proud of it. Mine is, too, but sometimes I feel like I'm suffocating. The truth is, the city hasn't really felt like home since I was 13 and fell in love with the lake and the cottage and the bush. Most of the time, though, I don't let myself think about that. I don't have time to. The world I've built for myself bursts with the trappings of urban busyness, the late hours at the office, the spin classes, and the many brunches. It's how I like it. An overstuffed calendar brings me joy. But every so often I catch myself fantasizing about leaving the city, finding a small place on the water to write, working at a restaurant on the side to pay the bills, and my skin starts feeling too tight, like my life doesn't fit. This would surprise pretty much everyone I know. I'm a 30-year-old woman who mostly has her shit together. My apartment is the top floor of a big house in Runcesfels, a Polish neighborhood where you can still find a decent enough pierogi. The space is striking, with exposed beams and slanting ceilings, and, sure, it's tiny, but a full one-bedroom in this part of the city doesn't come cheap, 
and my salary at Shelter Magazine is modest. Okay, it's crap. But that's typical of media jobs, and while my pay may be small, my job is a big one. I've worked at Shelter for four years, climbing steadily up the ranks from lowly editorial assistant to senior editor. That puts me in a position of power, assigning stories, and overseeing photo shoots at the country's biggest decor magazine. Thanks in large part to my efforts, we have amassed a dedicated following on social media and a huge online audience. It's work that I love and that I'm good at, and at Shelter's 40th anniversary bash, the magazine's editor-in-chief, Brenda, credited me with bringing the publication into the digital era. It was a career highlight. Being an editor is the kind of job that people think is extremely glamorous. It looks fast and flashy, though if I'm being honest, it mostly involves sitting in a cubicle all day, googling synonyms for minimalist. But there are product launches to attend and lunches to be shared with up-and-coming designers. It's also the kind of job that hotshot corporate lawyers and social climbing bankers swipe right on, which has proved useful in finding dates to join me on the cocktail party circuit. And there are perks, like press trips and open champagne bars, and an obscene amount of free stuff. There's also an endless flow of industry gossip for Chantal and me to chew over, our favorite way to pass a Thursday evening. And my mom never tires of seeing Persephone Fraser in print on the magazine's masthead. Charlie's phone call is an axe through my bubble, and I'm so anxious to get north that as soon as I hang up, I book a car and a motel room for tomorrow even though the funeral is a few days from now. It's like I've woken from a 12-year coma, and my head throbs in anticipation and terror. I'm going to see Sam. I sit down to write an email to my parents to tell them about Sue. They haven't been regularly checking their messages on this European vacation of theirs, so I don't know when they'll get it. I also don't know whether they were still in contact with Sue. Mom kept in touch with her for at least a few years after Sam and I broke up, but each time she'd mention any one of the Florex, my eyes would well up. Eventually she stopped giving me updates. I keep the notes short and when I'm done, I throw some clothes into the rim of a suitcase I couldn't afford but bought anyway. It's now well after midnight, and I have an interview for work in the morning and then a long drive, so I change into PJs, lie down, and shut my eyes but I'm too wired to sleep. There are these moments I come back to when I'm at my most nostalgic, when all I want to do is curl up in the past with Sam. I can play them in my mind as if they're old home videos. I used to watch them all the time in university, a bedtime routine as familiar as the pilled Hudson's Bay blanket I'd taken from the cottage. But the memories and the regrets they carried with them chafed like the blanket's wool, and I would lose nights imagining where Sam was at that precise moment wondering if there's a chance he might be thinking of me. Sometimes I felt sure he was, like there was an invisible, unbreakable string that ran between us, stretching vast distances and keeping us joined. Other times, I dozed off in the midst of a movie only to wake in the middle of the night, my lungs feeling like they were on the verge of collapse, and I'd have to breathe my way through the panic attack. Eventually, by the end of school, I'd managed to shut off the nightly broadcasts, filling my brain instead with looming exams and article deadlines and internship applications, and the panic attacks began to subside. Tonight I have no such restraint. I queue up our firsts, the first time we met, our first kiss, the first time Sam told me he loved me until the reality of seeing him starts to sink in, and my thoughts become a swirl of questions I don't have answers for. How will he react to my showing up? How much has he changed? Is he single? Or, fuck, is he married? My therapist, Jennifer, not Jen, never Jen, I made the mistake once and was sharply corrected. The woman has framed quotes on the wall, life begins after coffee, and I'm not weird I'm limited edition, so I'm not sure what kind of gravitas she thinks her full name adds. Anyway, Jennifer has tricks for coping with this kind of anxious spiraling, but deep belly breaths and mantras don't stand a chance tonight. I started seeing Jennifer a few years ago, shortly after the Thanksgiving I spent puking up rosé and spilling my guts to Chantal. I didn't want to talk to a therapist, I thought that panic attack had just been a blip on an otherwise, fairly successful, 
path to pushing Sam Florek out of my heart and mind, but Chantelle was insistent. This shit is above my pay grade, P, she told me with trademark blunt force. Chantal and I met as interns at the City Magazine where she is now the entertainment editor. We bonded over the peculiar business of fact-checking restaurant reviews, so the halibut is coated in a pine nut dust, not a pistachio crust, and the editor-in-chief's farcical obsession with tennis. The moment that solidified our friendship was during a story meeting that the editor literally began with the words, I've been thinking a lot about tennis, and then turned to Chantal, who was the only black person in the entire office, and said, you must be great at tennis. Her face remained perfectly composed when she replied that she did not play, while at the same time I blurted, are you kidding? Chantal is my closest girlfriend, not that there's much competition. My reluctance to share embarrassing or intimate parts of myself with other women makes them suspicious of me. For instance, Chantal knew I grew up with a cottage and that I hung around with the boys next door, but she had no idea about the extent of my relationship with Sam or how it ended in a messy explosion that left no survivors. I think the fact that I'd kept such a fundamental piece of my history from her was more shocking than the story of what happened all those years ago. You do understand what it means to her friends, right, she'd asked me after I told her the horrible truth. Considering that my two closest friends no longer speak to me, the answer probably should have been not really. But I have been a good friend to Chantal. I'm the person she calls to bitch about work or her future mother-in-law, who is continually suggesting Chantal relax her hair for the wedding. Chantal has no interest in wedding why things, except for having a big dance party an open bar, and a killer dress, which, fair, but since the event needs to come together somehow, I've become the default planner, putting together Pinterest boards with decor inspo. I'm reliable. I'm a good listener. I'm the one who knows what cool new restaurant has the hottest chef. I make excellent Manhattans. I am fun. I just don't want to talk about what keeps me awake at night. I don't want to reveal how I'm beginning to question whether climbing the ladder has made me happy, how sometimes I long to write but can't seem to find the courage, or how lonely I sometimes feel. Chantal is the only person who can pull it out of me. Of course, my reluctance to discuss Sam with Chantal has nothing to do with whether or not I think about him. Of course I do. But I try not to, and I don't stumble very often. I haven't had a panic attack since I started seeing Jennifer. I like to think I've grown over the last decade. I like to think I've moved on. Still, every once in a while, the sun will shimmer off Lake Ontario in a way that reminds me of the cottage, and I'm right back on the raft with him. And my hands are shaking so badly when I fill out the forms at the rental car counter that I'm surprised the clerk hands over the keys. Brenda was understanding when I called to ask for the rest of the week off, I told her there had been a death in the family, and while it was technically a lie, Sue was like family. At least she had been at one time. I probably hadn't needed to stretch the truth, though. I have taken precisely one day off this year for an extended Valentine's spa weekend with Chantal, we have marked the holiday together since we were both single, and no boyfriend or fiancé will put an end to the tradition. I briefly consider not telling Chantal where I'm going, but then I have visions of getting in an accident and no one knowing why I was on the highway far from the city. So I write a quick text from the rental car lot, adding a few I'm totally fine exclamation points before I hit send, your party was so much fun. Too much fun. Shouldn't have had that last spritz. Heading out of town for a few days for a funeral. Sam's mom. Her text buzzes seconds later, THE Sam. Are you okay? The answer is no. I'll be fine, I write back. My phone starts vibrating as soon as I hit send, but I let Chantal's call go to voicemail. I'm so low on sleep, I'm running purely on adrenaline and the two vats of coffee I drank at this morning's interview with a full of himself wallpaper designer. I really don't want to talk. In the time it takes me to navigate through the city streets and onto the 401, my bowels are in such tight knots that I need to pull into a Tim Hortons off the highway for an emergency bathroom break. 
I'm still shaky when I get back in the car, bottle of water and raisin bran muffin in hand, but a surreal kind of calm comes over me as I drive further north. Eventually, rocky outcrops of Canadian shield granite erupt from the land, and roadside signs for live bait and chip trucks emerge from the scrub. It's been so long since I've traveled this route, yet it's also familiar, like I'm driving back into another part of my life. The last time I made this trip was Thanksgiving weekend. I was alone then, too, racing up in the used Toyota I'd bought with my tip money. I didn't stop the entire four-hour drive. It had been three agonizing months since I'd seen Sam, and I was desperate for him to wrap his arms around me, to feel enveloped by his body, to tell him the truth. Could I have known how that weekend would give me both the greatest and most terrible moments of my life? How rapidly things would go very, very badly. That I would never see Sam again. My mistake had come months earlier, but could I have prevented the aftershocks that caused the most severe destruction? My stomach takes a roller coaster ride as soon as I spot a glimpse of the lake's southern end, and I take deep breaths ii in one, two, three, four, and oh you eat one, two, three, for all the way to the Cedar Grove Motel on the outskirts of town. It's late afternoon by the time I check in. I buy a copy of the local paper from the elderly man at the lobby desk and move the car in front of room 106. It's clean and nondescript. A generic print of a deer in a forest hanging over the bed and a frayed polyester quilt that was probably burgundy at the beginning of its long life are the only doses of color. I hang up the black sheath dress I've brought for the funeral and sit on the edge of the bed, tapping my fingers on my thighs and looking out the window. The north end of the lake, town dock, and public beach are just visible. I feel itchy. It seems wrong to be so close to the water but not go to the cottage. I've packed my bathing suit and towel so I could walk over to the beach, but all I want to do is dive off the end of my dock. There's just one problem, it's not my dock anymore. 4. Summer, 17 years ago. I'd never had a boy in my bedroom until that first evening when Charlie dropped Sam off on the doorstep of our cottage. As soon as we were alone, I was tongue-tied with nerves. Sam didn't seem to have the same problem. So what kind of name is Persephone, he asked, stuffing a third Oreo into his mouth. We were sitting on the floor, door open at mom's insistence. Given how sullen he was when we met, he was a lot chattier than I expected. Within minutes I learned he had lived next door all his life, he was also starting 8th grade in the fall, and that he liked Weezer well enough, but the shirt was actually a hammer-down from his brother. Almost all my clothes are, he explained matter-of-factly. Mom hadn't looked happy when I asked if Sam could stay for the evening. I don't know if that's the best idea, Persephone, she said slowly, right in front of him, then turned to dad for his input. I think it was less about Sam's boyness and more that mom wanted to keep me away from other teenagers for at least two months before we went back to the city. She needs to have a friend, Diane, he replied, to complete my mortification. Letting my hair fall across my face, I grabbed Sam by the arm and pulled him toward the stairs. It took five minutes for mom to check on us, holding a plate of Oreos like she did when I was six. I was surprised she didn't bring glasses of milk. We were munching on the cookies, chests speckled with dark crumbs, when Sam asked about my name. It's from Greek mythology, I told him. My parents are total geeks. Persephone is the goddess of the underworld. It doesn't really suit me. He studied the creature from the Black Lagoon poster and the stack of horror paperbacks on my bedside table, then fixed his gaze on me one eyebrow raised. I dunno. Goddess of the underworld. Seems like it suits you. Sounds pretty cool to me. He trailed off, his expression turning serious. Persephone, Persephone. He rolled my name around in his mouth like he was trying to figure out how it tasted. I like it. What's Sam short for? I asked, my hands and neck heating. Samuel. Nope. He smirked. Samson? Samwise? 
He jerked his head back like I'd surprised him. Lord of the Rings, nice. His voice cracked over the nice, and he gave me an off-kilter grin that sent another thrill zipping through my chest. But, nope. It's just Sam. My mom likes one-syllable names for boys, like Sam and Charles. She says they're stronger when they're short. But sometimes, when she's really pissed, she calls me Samuel. She says it gives her more to work with. I laughed at this, and his grin turned into a full-blown smile, one side slightly higher than the other. He had this easy way about him, like he wasn't trying to please anyone. I liked it. I want to be just like that. I was polishing off a cookie when Sam spoke again. So what did your dad mean downstairs? I feigned confusion. I'd been hoping he somehow hadn't heard. Sam squinted and added quietly, about you needing to have a friend. I winced, then swallowed, not sure of what to say or how much to tell him. I had some I made air quotes with my fingers issues with a few of the girls at school this year. They don't like me anymore. I fidgeted with the bracelet on my wrist while Sam pondered this. When I peered up at him, he was looking right at me, brows drawn like he was working out a math problem. Two girls in my class were suspended for bullying last year, he finally said. They were getting the boys to ask this one girl out as a prank, and then they'd tease her for believing it. As much as she despised me, I don't think Delilah would have gone that far. I wondered if Sam was part of the prank, and as if he could see my mind churning, he said, they wanted me to get in on it, but I wouldn't. It seemed mean and kind of messed up. It's totally messed up, I said, relieved. Keeping his blue eyes trained on me, he changed the subject. Tell me about this bracelet you keep playing with. He pointed to my wrist. This is my friendship bracelet. Before I was a social outcast, I was known for two things at school, my love of horror and my friendship bracelets. I wove them in elaborate patterns, but that was secondary to picking just the right colors. I carefully chose each palette to reflect the wearer's personality. Delilah's was pinks and deep reds, feminine and powerful. My own was a trendy mix of neon orange, neon pink, peach, white, and grey. Delilah had always been the prettiest, most popular girl in our class, and even though the other kids liked me, I knew my status was due to my proximity to her. When I got requests for bracelets from every girl in our class and even a few of the 8th graders, I felt like I finally had my own thing aside from being Delilah's funny sidekick. I felt creative and cool and interesting. But then one day, I found the bracelets I'd made for my three best friends cut up in little pieces in my desk. Who gave it to you? Sam asked. Oh, well, no one did. I made it myself. The pattern is really cool. Thanks. I perked up. I've been practicing all year. I thought the neons and the peach were kind of funky together. Definitely he said, leaning closer. Could you make me one, he asked, looking back up at me. He wasn't kidding. I hopped up and dug out the embroidery floss kit from my desk. I placed the small wooden box with my initials carved on top on the floor between us. I've got a bunch of different colors, but I'm not sure if I have anything you'll like, I said, pulling out the rainbow loops of thread. I'd never done one for a boy before. But tell me what you're into, and if I don't have it, I can get Mom to take me into town to see if we can find it. Usually I know people a little better before I make them. It might sound silly, but I try to match the colors to their personality. That doesn't sound silly, he said. So what do those colors say about you? He reached out and tugged on one of the strings dangling from my wrist. His hands were like his feet, too big for his body. They reminded me of the oversized paws of a German shepherd puppy. Well, these don't really mean anything, I stammered. I just thought it was a sophisticated palette. I returned to organizing the embroidery floss, lining them up in a tidy row from light to dark on the wood floor between us. Maybe I could make it in blues to match your eyes? 
I said, thinking aloud. I don't have a ton of blue, so I'll just need to get a few more shades. I glanced at Sam to see what he thought, except he wasn't looking at the floss, he was staring right at me. That's okay, he said. I want it to be just like yours. The next morning I scarfed down breakfast, then raced to the water with my kit. I sat cross-legged on the dock and fastened the bracelet to my shorts with a safety pin to work on it while I waited for Sam. When his footsteps tramped across the dock next door, it was almost like they were right beside me. He was wearing the same navy shorts as yesterday, it looked like they might fall off his narrow hips at any moment. I waved at him, and he raised his hand and then dove off the end of the dock and paddled toward me. He was in the water in front of me in under a minute. You're fast, I said, impressed. I've taken swimming lessons, but I'm nowhere near as good as you. Sam gave me the crooked grin, then hauled himself out of the water and plopped down next to me. Water dripped off his hair and ran in rivulets down his face and his chest, which was almost concave in form. If he was at all self-conscious about being half-naked next to a girl, I wouldn't have known it. He pulled on the strands of embroidery floss I was working on. Is that my bracelet? It looks great. I started it last night, I told him. They don't actually take that long to make. I should be able to finish it for you tomorrow. Awesome. He motioned to the raft. Ready to collect your payment? Sam had agreed to show me how to do a flip off the raft in exchange for the bracelet. Definitely, I said, taking off my Jay's hat and slathering copious amounts of SPF all over my face. You're really into sun safety, huh? He picked up the hat. I guess. Well, no. It's more that I'm not into freckles, and the sun gives me freckles. They're okay on my arms and stuff, but I don't want them all over my face. What I wanted was a creamy, unblemished complexion like Delilah Mason's. Sam shook his head, baffled, then his eyes lit up. Did you know that freckles are caused by an overproduction of melanin that gets stimulated by the sun? My jaw dropped. What, he said. It's true. No, I believe you, I said slowly. It's just a really random fact for you to know. He grinned. I'm going to be a doctor. I know a lot of he made air quotes random facts, as you call them. You already know what you want to be? I was blown away. I had no clue what I wanted to do. Not even close. English was my best subject, and I like to write, but I never really thought about having a grown-up job. I've always wanted to be a doctor, a cardiologist, but my school kind of sucks. I don't want to be stuck here forever, so I learn stuff on my own. My mom orders used textbooks for me online, Sam explained. I took this in. So, you're smart, huh? I guess. And then he stood, a stack of arms and legs and pointy joints, and hauled me up by my arms. He was surprisingly strong for someone so weedy. And I'm an awesome swimmer. Come on, I'll show you how to do that somersault. Countless belly flops, a few dives, and one semi-successful somersault later, Sam and I lay outstretched on the raft, faces to the sky, the already hot morning sun drying our bathing suits. You're always doing that, Sam said, looking over at me. Doing what? Touching your hair. I shrugged. I should have listened to mom when she told me bangs wouldn't work for my hair type. Instead, one spring evening while my parents were marking papers, I took matters and mom's good sewing shears into my own hands. Except that I couldn't get the bangs to lie evenly, and every snip just made things worse. In less than five minutes, I had totally butchered my hair. I crept downstairs to the living room, tears running down my face. Hearing my sniffles, my parents turned to see me standing with scissors in hand. Persephone! What on earth? My mother gasped and flung herself at me, checking my wrists and arms for signs of damage, before hugging me tightly, while dad sat agape. 
Don't worry, honey. We'll get this fixed, mom said, stepping away to make an appointment at her salon. If you're going to have bangs, they need to look intentional. Dad gave me a weak smile. What were you thinking, kiddo? My parents had already put in an offer on a lakeside property in Barry's Bay, but seeing me clutching those scissors must have sent them over the edge, because the next day Dad called the realtor and told her to up the offer. They wanted me out of the city as soon as the school year ended. But even today I think my parents were probably overreacting. Diane and Arthur Fraser, both professors at the University of Toronto, doted on me in a way particular to older, upper-middle-class parents with just one child. My mom, a sociology scholar, was in her late thirties when they had me, my father, who taught Greek mythology, was in his early forties. My every request for a new toy, a trip to the bookstore, or supplies for a new hobby was met with enthusiasm and a credit card. Being a child who preferred earning gold stars to causing trouble, I didn't give them much need for discipline. In turn, they gave me a very long leash. So when the three girls who formed my closest circle of friends turned their backs on me, I was unaccustomed to dealing with any sort of adversity and I had no idea how to cope except to try my hardest to win them back. Delilah was our group's uncontested ruler, a position we bestowed upon her because she possessed the two most important requirements for teenage leadership, an exceptionally pretty face and total awareness of the power it gave her. Since it was Delilah whom I angered, and Delilah whom I needed to win back, my attempts to gain readmittance to the group were targeted at her. I thought cutting my bangs like hers would demonstrate my loyalty. Instead, when she saw me at school, she raised her voice in an exaggerated whisper, and said, God, does everyone have bangs these days? I think it's time to grow mine out. Every morning I dreaded the school day, sitting alone at recess, watching my old friends laugh together, wondering if it was me they were laughing about. A summer away from everything, where I could read my books without worrying about being called a freak and swim whenever I wanted to, felt like heaven. I looked over at Sam. Where's your brother today? I asked, thinking of how they'd goofed around in the water the day before. Sam turned onto his stomach and propped himself up on his forearms. Why do you want to know about my brother? He asked, his brows knitted together. No reason. I just wondered. Is he having friends over tonight? Sam looked at me from the corner of his eye. What I really wanted to know was if Sam wanted to hang out again. His friends were over really late, he said finally. He was still asleep when I came down to the lake. I don't know what's going on tonight. Oh, I said limply, then decided to take a risk. Well, if you want to come over again, that'd be cool. Our TV's kind of small, but we have a big DVD collection. I might just do that said Sam, his forehead relaxing. Or you could come over to our place. Our TV is pretty decent. Mom's never home, but she wouldn't mind you being there. You guys are allowed to have friends over when she's not there? My parents were by no means strict, but they were always home when I had people over. One or two is okay, but Charlie likes to have parties. Just small ones, but mom gets mad if she comes home and there's, like, ten kids in the house. Does that happen a lot? I'd never been to a real teenager party. I crawled to the edge of the raft and dangled my feet in the water to cool off. Yeah, but mostly they're pretty boring, and mom doesn't find out. Sam came and sat beside me, plunging his shoestring legs into the lake, kicking them back and forth. I usually stay in my room, reading or whatever. If he has a girl over, then he tries to get rid of me like last night. Does he have a girlfriend? I asked. Sam pushed back the hair that had fallen over his eye, and gave me a suspicious sideways glance. I'd never had a boyfriend, and unlike a lot of girls in my class, getting one wasn't high on my priority list. But I'd also never been kissed and would have given my right arm for someone to think I was pretty enough to kiss. Charlie always has a girlfriend, he said. 
he just doesn't have them for very long. So, I said, changing the subject. How come your mom's not around a lot? You ask a lot of questions, you know that. He didn't say it harshly, but his comment sent a prickle of fear down my neck. I hesitated. I don't mind, he said, nudging me with his shoulder. I felt my body relax. Mom runs a restaurant. You probably don't know it yet. The tavern? It's our family's place. I do know it, actually. I said, remembering the packed patio. Mom and I drove past. What kind of restaurant is it? Polish, like Pierages and stuff. My family's Polish. I had no idea what a pierogi was, but I didn't let on. It looked really busy when we went by. There aren't many places to eat here. But the food's good. Mom makes the best pierogies ever. But it's a lot of work, so she's gone most days from the afternoon on. Doesn't your dad help? Sam paused before responding. Ah, uh, no. Okay, I said. So, why not? My dad's dead, Percy, he said, watching a jet ski roar by. I didn't know what to say. What I should have said was nothing. But instead, I've never met anyone with a dead dad before. I immediately wanted to scoop the words up and shove them back down my throat. My eyes went wide with panic. Would it make things more or less awkward if I jumped in the lake? Sam turned to me slowly, blinked once, stared straight into my eyes, and said, I've never met anyone with such a big mouth before. I felt like I was caught in a net. I sat there, mouth hanging open, my throat and eyes burning. And then the straight line of his lips curled up at one corner, and he laughed. Just kidding, he said. Not about my dad being dead, and actually you do have a big mouth, but I don't mind. My relief was instant, but then Sam put his hands on my shoulders and gave them a little shake. I stiffened, it was like all the nerve endings in my body had moved to beneath his fingers. Sam gave me a funny look, squeezing my shoulders gently. You okay there? He shifted his head down to meet my eyes. I took an unsteady breath. Sometimes things just come out of my mouth before I think about how they sound or even what I'm really saying. I didn't mean to be rude. I'm sorry about your dad, Sam. Thanks, he said softly. It happened a bit over a year ago, but most of the kids at school are still weird about it. I'll take your questions over the pity any day. Okay, I said. No more questions, he asked with a smirk. I'll save them for later, I said, standing on shaky legs. Want to show me that somersault again? He jumped up beside me, a crooked smile on his mouth. Nope. And then in a flash, he grabbed my waist and pushed me into the water. We fell into an easy routine that first week of summer. There was a narrow path by the shore that ran through the bush between our two properties, and we went back and forth several times a day. We spent the morning swimming and jumping off the raft, then read on the dock until the sun got too hot, and then we'd hit the water again. Despite how often she was at the restaurant, it took Sue just a few days to figure out that Sam and I were spending more time together than apart. She showed up on our doorstep, Sam in tow, holding a large Tupperware container of homemade pierages. She was surprisingly young, like, way younger than my parents, and dressed more like me than a grown-up in denim cutoffs and a grey tank top, her pale blonde hair pulled back into a swishy ponytail. She was small and soft, and her smile was wide and dimpled like Charlie's. Mom put on a pot of coffee and the three adults sat out on the deck chatting while Sam and I eavesdropped from the couch. Sue assured Mom and Dad that I was welcome at her house anytime, that Sam was a freakishly responsible kid, and that she'd keep an eye on us, at least when she was home. She must have had those boys right out of high school, I heard mom telling dad that evening. It's different up here, was all he said. 
Sam and I ended up spending most of our time in the water or at his place. On the days when the sun was too hot, we'd head up to the house, which was built in the style of an old farmhouse, painted white. A basketball net hung above the garage door. Sue hated air conditioning, preferring to keep the windows open to feel the breeze off the lake, but the basement was always cool. Sam and I would flop down at either end of the cushy red plaid sofa and put on a movie. We were starting to make our way through my horror collection. Sam had seen just one or two, but it didn't take long for him to catch my enthusiasm. I think half the fun for him was correcting any, and every, scientifically unsound detail he picked up on the unrealistic amount of blood being his favorite sticking point. I'd roll my eyes and say, thanks, doc, but I liked how closely he paid attention. We took turns picking what to watch, but according to Sam, I went all weird when he wanted to watch The Evil Dead. I had my reasons, the movie was why my three best friends no longer spoke to me. I ended up telling Sam the entire story, which involved a sleepover at my house and an ill-advised screening of the bloodiest, raunchiest film in my collection. Because Delilah, Yvonne, and Marissa liked the horror stories I read at school, I had assumed The Evil Dead was a no-brainer. We huddled around the TV in nests of blankets and pillows, wearing our pajamas, with bowls of popcorn in hand, and watched a group of hot twentisomethings head to a creepy cabin in the woods. During the most disturbing scene, Delilah covered her face, then sprang from the sofa and ran to the bathroom, leaving a wet spot behind on the ultra-suede fabric. The girls and I looked at each other wide-eyed, and I hurried to the cupboard to get paper towels and a bottle of cleaning spray. I hoped Delilah would forget about the whole peeing her pants thing by the time we returned to school. She did not. Not even close. If she had, I would have been spared the next few months of torture. That was pretty disgusting, Sam said when the credits were rolling. But also awesome. Right? I said, jumping onto my knees to face him. It's a classic. I'm not weird for liking it, right? His eyes popped at my sudden display of energy. Did I sound nuts? I think I probably did. Well, I can see why that Delilah girl was so freaked out by it I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight. But she's a jerk, and you're not weird for liking it, he said. I slumped back down onto the couch, satisfied. You're just weird in general, he added, holding back a grin, and I lobbed a cushion at him. He raised his hands and laughed but I like weird. I would have been thankful for any friend that summer, but finding Sam was like winning the friendship lottery. He was nerdy in a good way and sarcastic in a hilarious way, and he liked to read almost as much as I did, though he was more into books about wizards and magazines about science and nature. There was a whole shelf of National Geographic magazines in his basement, and I think he'd read all of them. Sam was fast becoming my favorite person. And I'm pretty sure he felt the same, he always wore the bracelet I made him. He once pulled it down to show me the pale ring of skin underneath it. Sometimes he'd leave for an excruciatingly long morning or afternoon to hang out with his friends from school, but when he was home, we were almost always together. By midsummer, a smattering of freckles dotted my nose, cheeks, and chest. As if they had somehow escaped my notice, Sam leaned in close to my face one day when we were lying on the raft, and said, I guess SPF 45 wasn't strong enough. I guess not, I growled. And thanks for reminding me. I don't understand why you hate your freckles so much, he said. I like them. I stared at him, unblinking. Seriously? I asked. Who in their right mind likes freckles? Ye. He drew the word out and gave me a why are you being so weird? Look, which I chose to ignore. Swear on it? Swear on what, he asked, and I hesitated. You said swear on it, he explained. What do you want me to swear on? Um. I hadn't meant it literally. I looked around, my eyes landing on his wrist. Swear on our friendship bracelet. His brows furrowed, but then he reached over and hooked his index finger under my bracelet, 
giving it a gentle tug. I swear, he vowed. Now you swear that you'll drop this weird freckle obsession. A small smile played on his lips, and I let out a little laugh before reaching over and curling my finger around his bracelet, tugging on it like he had. I swear. I rolled my eyes, but secretly I was pleased. And I didn't worry too much about my freckles after that. Halloween in August was the official name Sam and I gave to the week we devoted to binging the entire Halloween franchise. We had just put on the fourth movie when Charlie loped down the basement stairs in his boxes and launched himself over the couch between us. Charlie, I had learned, was always wearing a smile and rarely a shirt. Could you get any further away from her, Samuel, he chuckled. Could you get any more naked, Charles? Sam deadpanned. Charlie's face split into a toothy smile. Sure, he cried, jumping up and hooking his thumbs into the waistband of his boxers. I yelped and covered my eyes. Jesus, Charlie. Cut it out, Sam yelled, his voice cracking. Both the Florek boys liked to tease, whereas I was the object of Sam's gentle ribbing, Sam was subjected to Charlie's relentless digs about his scrawniness and sexual inexperience. Sam rarely talked back, and the only sign of his irritation was the red stain on his cheeks. At the lake, Charlie pushed Sam into the water at every possible chance, to the point that even I found it annoying. He does it more when you're around, Sam told me one day. Charlie laughed and plunked back down on the couch. He elbowed my side and said, your neck's all blotchy, P-E-R-S. He pulled my arms away from my face and put his hand over my knee and squeezed. Sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. I glanced at Sam, but he was staring at Charlie's hand on my leg. We were interrupted by Sue calling us up for lunch. A platter of cheese and potato pierages waited for us on the round table in the kitchen. It was a sunny space with cream cabinets, windows overlooking the lake, and a sliding glass door onto the deck. Sue stood at the sink in her denim cutoffs and a white t-shirt, her hair pulled back into her usual ponytail, washing up a large pot. Hi, Mrs. Florek, I said, sitting down and helping myself to three massive dumplings. Thanks for making lunch. She turned around from the sink. Charlie, go put on some clothes. And you're welcome, Percy, I know how much you like my pierages. I love them, I said, and she gave me one of her toothy, dimpled smiles. Sam told me pierages had been his dad's favorite and Sue had stopped making them at home before I came around. After I finished my serving, I piled more onto my plate along with a large dollop of sour cream. Sam, your girlfriend eats like a horse, Charlie laughed. I winced at the G word. Cut it out, Charlie, Sue snapped. Never comment on how much a woman eats, and don't tease them. They're too young for any of that, anyway. Well, I'm not too young, Charlie said, wiggling his eyebrows in my direction. Want to trade up, Percy? Charlie. Sue barked. I'm just messing around, he said and stood up to clear his plate, knocking his brother across the back of the head. I tried to catch Sam's eye, but he was scowling at Charlie, his face the color of a field tomato. As the last week of summer vacation came to an end, I began dreading heading back to the city. I had dreams about going to school naked and finding Sam's bracelet cut up into orange and pink pieces in my desk. We were lying on the raft the afternoon before I was leaving. I had tried my best all day not to be a downer, but apparently I wasn't doing a very good job because Sam kept asking if I was okay. Suddenly, he sat up and said, you know what you need? One last boat ride. The Florex had a small 9.9 motor on the back of their rowboat that Sam had taught me how to drive. I grabbed my book, and Sam gathered his rod and tackle box. We folded our towels across the benches and set off in our damp bathing suits and bare feet. I drove to a reedy bay, which Sam claimed was a good spot for fishing, and cut the engine. 
I'd been watching him cast off the front of the boat when he started talking. It was a heart attack, he said, his eyes on his rod. I swallowed but stayed quiet. We don't talk about him much at home, he added, reeling the line in. And definitely not with my friends. They could barely look at me at the funeral. And even now, if they mention something about one of their dads, they look at me like they've accidentally said something super offensive. That sucks, I said. I can tell you all about my dad if you want. But I warn you, he's totally boring. He smiled, and I went on. But seriously, you don't have to talk with me, either. Not if you don't want to. That's the thing, he said, squinting into the sun. I do. I wish we'd talk about him more at home, but it makes mom sad. He set down his rod and looked up at me. I'm starting to forget stuff about him, you know? I climbed into the middle bench, closer to him. I don't really know. I don't know anyone with a dead dad, remember? I nudged his foot with my toe, and he huffed out a laugh. But I can imagine. I can listen. He nodded once and ran his hand through his hair. It happened at the restaurant. He was cooking. Mom was at home and someone called to tell us that Dad had fallen and that the ambulance had taken him to the hospital. It only took us ten minutes to get there you know how close the hospital is, but it didn't matter. He was gone. He said it quickly, like it hurt to get the words out. I reached out and squeezed his hand, then twisted his bracelet around so the best part of the pattern faced up. I'm sorry, I whispered. Explains the whole doctor thing. Huh? I could tell he was trying to sound upbeat, but his voice was dull. I smiled but didn't reply. Tell me what he was like when you're ready, I said instead. I want to hear all about him. Okay. He picked up the rod again. Then added, sorry for going all emo on your last day. Suits my mood, anyway. I shrugged. I'm kind of depressed about summer ending. I don't want to go home tomorrow. He bumped my knee with his. I don't want you to go, either. 5. Now. Sue's face is staring at me, hair pulled back, smile so wide it's beckoned her dimples. There are fine lines fanning out from her eyes that didn't used to be there, but even on the local paper's smudged newsprint. You can see determination in the slight upward tilt of her chin and the hand that rests on her hip. She's standing in front of the tavern in the photo, which runs under the headline tribute to a beloved Barry's Bay business leader. I've become skilled at warding off the loneliness that threatened to pull me under in my early twenties. It's a formula that involved throwing myself into work, no string sex, and overpriced cocktails with Chantal. It took years to perfect. But sitting in the motel room with Sue's obituary in my hands and the lake sparkling in the distance, I can feel it in every part of my body, the twisting of my gut, the ache in my neck, the tightness in my chest. I could talk to Chantal. She sent three more texts, asking me to call her, asking me when the funeral is, asking whether I want her to come. I should at least text her back. But Thanksgiving breakdown aside, I haven't spoken to her about Sam too often. I tell myself I don't have the energy to get into it right now, but it's more that if I start talking about him, about how monumental it feels to be here, how scary, I may not be able to hold it together. What I really need is a bottle of wine. My stomach gurgles. And maybe some food. I haven't eaten anything except for the Raisin Bran muffin from my emergency Tim Hortons stop. It's a blistering late afternoon, so I throw on the lightest thing I've packed a sleeveless poppy-coloured cotton dress that hits above the knees. It has large buttons down the front and a belted waist. I fasten my gold sandals and head out the door. It takes about twenty minutes to walk to the centre of town. My bangs are stuck to my forehead by the time I get there, and I hold my hair in a dense pile on top of my head to cool my neck down. Other than a new cafe with a sandwich board advertising lattes and cappuccinos, neither of which you could get in town when I was a kid, the family businesses on the main street are pretty much the same. 
Somehow I'm not prepared for the wallop of seeing the butter yellow building and the red sign painted with Polish folk art flowers. I stand in the middle of the sidewalk, staring. The tavern is in darkness, the green patio umbrellas folded shut. This is probably the first time since the restaurant opened that it's been closed on a Thursday evening in July. There's a small sign taped to the front door, and without thinking, I move toward it. It's a short message, written with black marker, the tavern is closed until August to mourn the loss of owner Sue Florek. We thank you for your support and understanding. I wonder who wrote it. Sam? Charlie? Butterflies swarm my stomach. I lean into the glass door with my hands cupped around my face and notice a light on inside. It's coming from the windows that lead into the kitchen. Someone's in there. As if drawn by a magnetic force, I head around to the back of the building. The heavy steel door that leads into the kitchen is propped open a few inches. The butterflies become a flock of flapping gulls. I pull the door wider and step inside. And then I freeze. At the dishwasher stands a tall, sandy-haired man, and although his back is turned to me, he is as unmistakable as my own reflection. He's wearing sneakers, a blue t-shirt, and navy and white striped board shorts. He's still slim but there's so much more of him. All golden brown skin and broad shoulders and strong legs. He's scrubbing something in the sink, a tea towel over one shoulder. I watch the muscles clench in his back as he lifts a platter into the washer rack. The sight of his large hands sends blood rushing to my ears so loudly it's like waves are crashing inside my head. I remember when he knelt over me in his bedroom, running those fingers along my body like he had discovered a new planet. His name slides softly from my lips. Sam? He turns, a look of confusion across his face. His eyes are the clear blue skies they always were, but so much else is different. The edges of his cheekbones and jaw are harder, and the skin underneath his eyes is tinged purple, as if sleep has eluded him for nights on end. His hair is shorter than he used to wear it, cropped close on the sides and only a little floppy on top, and his arms are thick and corded. He was beautiful at 18, but adult Sam is so devastating I could cry. I missed him becoming this. And the grief of that loss of seeing Sam grow into a man is a fist squeezing around my lungs. Sam's gaze moves across my face and then drops down my body. I can see the flint of recognition that sparks when his eyes make their way back up to mine. Sam always kept a snug-fitting seal on his feelings, but I spent six years figuring out how to pry it off. I devoted hours to studying the subtle movement of emotions across his features. They were like rain that travelled from the far shore and across the water, unassuming until it was right there, pelting the cottage windows. I memoized his shimmers of mischief, the distant thunder of his jealousy, and the white caps of his ecstasy. I knew Sam Florek. His eyes lock onto mine. Their hold is as unrelenting as ever. His lips are pinched into a flat line and his chest expands in slow, steady breaths. I take a hesitant step forward as if I'm approaching a wild horse. His eyebrows shoot up, and he shakes his head once like he's been startled from a dream. I halt. We stand staring at each other silently, and then he takes three giant strides toward me and wraps his arms around me so tight it's like his large body is a cocoon around mine. He smells like sun and soap and something new that I don't recognize. When he speaks, his voice is a deep rasp that I want to drown in. You came home. I squeeze my eyes shut. I came home. Sam pulls back from me, his hands on my shoulders. His eyes ping around my face in disbelief. I give him a small smile. Hi, I say. The lopsided grin that curves his mouth is a drug I've never kicked. The faint crinkles at the corners of his eyes and the stubble on his face are new and so, sexy. Sam is sexy. So many times I've wondered about what he'd be like all grown up, but the reality of 30-year-old Sam is so much more solid and dangerous than what I could have imagined. Hi, Percy. My name passes from his lips and straight to my bloodstream, 
a sudden injection of desire and shame and a thousand memories. And just as quickly, I remember why I'm here. Sam, I'm so sorry, I say, my voice cracking. I'm so raw with grief and regret that I can't stop the tears that roll down my cheeks. And then Sam is holding me again, whispering, shush, into my hair while he moves one hand up and down my back. It's okay, Percy, he whispers, and when I peer up at him, his forehead is wrinkled in concern. I should be comforting you, I say, wiping my cheeks. I'm sorry. Don't worry about that. His voice is soft as he pats my back and then takes a step back, running his hand through his hair. The familiar gesture tugs a frayed string inside me. She was sick for years. We had a long time to come to terms with it. I can't imagine any amount of time being long enough. She was so young. 52. I inhale sharply, because that's even younger than I had guessed. And I can imagine how this must gnaw at Sam. His dad was young, too. I hope it's okay that I came, I say. I wasn't sure you'd want me here. Yeah, of course. He says it as if it hasn't been more than a decade since we spoke. As if he doesn't hate me. He turns back to the dishwasher, emptying a tray of side plates and stacking them on the counter. How did you know? He glances at me and squints when I don't immediately reply. Ah. He's already figured out the answer, but I tell him anyway. Charlie called me. His face darkens. Of course he did, he says flatly. There are serving dishes and chafing trays lined up on the counters, the kind of equipment needed to cater a big function. I move beside him at the dishwashing station and begin putting some dusty serving utensils in a rack to run through the washer. It's the same machine from when I worked here. I've run it so many times I could do it with my eyes closed. So what's all this for? I ask, keeping my eyes on the sink. But I don't get a response. I can tell from the quiet that Sam has stopped emptying dishes. I take a deep breath, in one, two, three, for an out one, two, three, four, before looking over my shoulder. He's leaning against the counter, arms crossed, watching me. What are you doing? he asks, voice rough. I turn to face him straight on, taking another deep breath, and from some deep forgotten place, I find Percy, the girl I used to be. I lift my chin and give him an incredulous look, putting a hand on my hip. My hand is soaking wet, but I ignore that as well as the swooping in my stomach. I'm helping you out, genius. The water seeps through my dress, but I don't budge. I don't look away. A muscle in his jaw twitches and his frown loosens just enough that I know I've stuck a knife under his sealer lid. A smile threatens to ruin my poker face, and I bite my lip to hold it back. His eyes flash to my mouth. You are always a shit dishwasher, I say, and he bursts out laughing, the rich bellow bouncing off the kitchen steel surfaces. It is the most magnificent sound. I want to record it so I can listen to it later, again and again. I don't know the last time I've smiled this widely. His blue eyes sparkle when they find mine, then drift down to the wet spot my hand has left on my hip. He swallows. His neck is the same golden brown as his arms. I want to stick my nose at the curve where it meets his shoulder and inhale a hit of him. I see your trash talk hasn't improved, he says with affection, and I feel like I've won a marathon. He motions to the dishes on the counter and sighs. Mom wanted to have everyone here for a party after she passed. The idea of people standing around with crustless egg salad sandwiches in the church basement after her funeral horrified her. She wants us to eat and drink and have fun. She was very specific. He says it with love, but he sounds tired. She even made the pierages and cabbage rolls she wanted served months ago, when she was still well enough and put them in the freezer. My eyes and throat burn, but I stay strong this time. That sounds like your mom. Organized and thoughtful and always stuffing people full of carbs. 
I was going to say, feeding the people she loves, I reply. Sam smiles, but it's a sad one. We stand there in the quiet, surveying the tidy array of equipment and plates. Sam pulls the tea towel off his shoulder and sets it down on the counter, giving me a long look as if he's deciding something. He points to the door. Let's get out of here. We're eating ice cream and sitting on the same bench we used to as kids, not far from the center of town on the North Shore. I can see the motel across the bay in the distance. The sun has dipped low in the sky, and there's a breeze coming off the water. We haven't spoken much, which is okay with me because sitting beside Sam feels unreal. His long legs are spread out beside mine, and I'm fixated on the size of his knees and his leg hair. Sam grew out of his stringy phase after he hit puberty, but he is so thoroughly a man now. Percy? Sam asks, breaking my focus. Yeah? I turn toward him. You might want to eat that a little faster. He points to the pink and blue trail of ice cream dripping down my hand. Shit. I try to catch it with a napkin, but a blob lands on my chest. I dab at it, but it only seems to make matters worse. Sam watches from the corner of his eye with a smirk. I can't believe you still eat cotton candy. How old are you? He teases. I motion to his waffle cone with two massive scoops of moose tracks, the same flavor he used to order as a kid. You're one to talk. Vanilla, caramel, peanut butter cups. Moose tracks is classic, he scoffs. No way. Cotton candy is the best. You just never learn to appreciate it. Sam raises one brow in an expression of absolute trouble, then leans over and runs his tongue flat over my scoop of ice cream, biting off a hunk from the top. I let out an involuntary gasp, my mouth hanging open as I stare at his teeth marks. I remember the first time Sam did that when we were 15. The glimpse of his tongue shocked me speechless then, too. I don't look up until he elbows me in the side. That always freaked you out, he chuckles in a soft baritone. Menace. I smile, ignoring the pressure building in my lower belly. I'll give you a taste of mine to be fair. He tilts his cone to me. This is new. I wipe away the beads of sweat forming above my lip. Sam notices, giving me a crooked grin as though he can read every dirty thought that's running through my mind. I promise it's good, he says, and his voice is as dark and smooth as coffee. I'm not used to this Sam, one who seems fully aware of his effect on me. I can tell he doesn't think I'll do it, but that just spurs me on. I take a quick taste of his cone. You're right, I say, shrugging. It's pretty good. His eyes flash to my mouth, and then he clears his throat. We sit in awkward silence for a minute. So how have you been, Percy, he asks, and I hold my hands up helplessly. I'm not sure where to start, I laugh, nervous. How do you even begin after so much time has passed? How about three updates? He nudges me, his eyes glinting. It was a game we used to play. We went for long stretches apart, and whenever we'd see each other again, we'd tell each other our three biggest pieces of news in rapid fire. I have a new draft of my story for you to read. I'm training for the 400 meter freestyle. I got a B on my algebra exam. I laugh again, but my throat has gone dry. Um. I squint out at the water. It's been more than a decade but has that much really happened? I still live in Toronto, I start, taking a bite of ice cream to delay. Mom and Dad are well, they're traveling around Europe. And I'm a journalist, an editor, actually I work at Shelter, the design magazine. A journalist, ha, huh, he says with a smile. That's great, Percy. I'm happy for you. I'm glad you're writing. I don't correct him. My work involves little writing, mostly headlines and the odd article. Being an editor is all about telling other people what to write. And what about you? 
I ask, returning my focus to the water in front of us, the sight of Sam sitting beside me is too jarring. I'd looked him up on social media years earlier, his profile picture was a shot of the lake, but never took the step of adding him as a friend. 1. I'm a doctor now. Wow. That's, that's incredible, Sam, I say. Not that I'm surprised. Predictable, right? And, too, I specialized in cardiology. Another shocker. He's not bragging at all. If anything, he sounds a bit embarrassed. Exactly where you wanted to be. I'm happy for him it's what he was always working toward. But somehow it also hurts that his life continued without me as planned. I made my way through my first year of university in a fog, struggling through my creative writing classes, not able to focus on much of anything, let alone character development. Eventually a professor suggested I give journalism a shot. The rules of reporting and story structure made sense to me, gave me an outlet that didn't feel so personal, so connected to Sam. I abandoned my dream of being an author, but I eventually set new goals. There's speculation that when it's time for a new editor-in-chief at Shelter, I'll be at the top of the list. I created a different path for myself, one that I love, but it stings that Sam managed to follow his original one. And three, he says, I'm living here. In Barry's Bay. I jerk my head back, and he laughs softly. Sam was as determined to leave Barry's Bay as he was to become a doctor. I assumed after he left for school he'd never move back. From the moment we were together together, I dreamed of what our life would be like when we finally lived in the same place. I imagined moving to wherever he was doing his residency after my undergrad. I would write fiction and wait tables until our incomes were steady. We'd come back to Barry's Bay whenever we could, splitting our time between the country and the city. I stayed in Kingston for my residency, he explains, as if reading my mind. Sam attended med school at Queen's University in Kingston, one of the top schools in the whole country. Kingston was nowhere near as large as Toronto, but it sat on Lake Ontario. Sam was meant to be near water. But I've been here for the last year to help mom. She was sick for a year before that. We were hopeful at first. He looks out over the water. I'm sorry, I whisper, and we sit quietly for a few minutes, finishing our cones and watching someone fish off the town dock. After a while, it didn't seem like things were going to get any better, he says, picking up from where he left off. I had been driving back and forth between here and Kingston, but I wanted to come home. You know, go to the treatments and all the appointments. Help out around the house and at the restaurant. It was too much for her even when she was healthy. The tavern was always meant to be her and dad. The thought of Sam being here for the past year, living in that house down on Bear Rock Lane, without me knowing, without me being here to help, feels monumentally wrong. I put my hand over his briefly and squeeze before returning it to my lap. He tracks its movement. What about your work? I ask, my voice hoarse. I've been working at the hospital here. A few shifts a week. He sounds tired again. Your mom must have really appreciated you coming back, I say, trying to sound upbeat instead of how bruised I feel. She knew you didn't want to stay here. It's not so bad, Sam says, sounding like he means it and for the second time this evening my jaw drops. I'm serious, he promises with a small grin. I know I ragged on Barry's Bay when I was a kid, but I missed it a lot when I was away at school. I'm lucky to have this, he says, nodding to the water. Who are you and what have you done with Sam Florek? I joke. But no, that's great. It's so amazing that you came to help your mom. And that you don't hate it here. I've missed this place so much. Every summer I get cabin fever in the city. All that concrete it feels so hot and itchy. I'd do anything to jump into the lake. He studies me, a serious look coming over his face. Well, we'll have to make that happen. I give him a small smile, 
then look out over the bay. If things had turned out differently, would I have been living here for the past year? Keeping Sue company at her appointments? Helping with the tavern? Would I have kept writing? I would have wanted to. I would have wanted all of that. The loss squeezes at my lungs again, and I have to focus on my breath. Without looking, I can feel Sam's attention on the side of my face. I can't believe you were here all that time, I murmur, pushing the hair off my forehead. He prods my leg with his foot, and I tilt my head to him. He's wearing the biggest smirk, his eyes crinkled at the corners. I can't believe you got bangs again. 6. Summer, 16 years ago. 8th grade didn't suck. It didn't suck, but it was weird. I, finally, got my period. Kyle Houston touched my butt at the spring dance. And by the end of September, Delilah Mason and I were best friends again. She had clamped up to me in a pair of white cowboy boots and a short denim skirt on the first day of school and complimented my tan. I told her about the cottage, trying to play it as cool as possible, and she filled me in on the equestrian camp she attended in the Kawarthas. There was a horse named Monopoly and an embarrassing period story involving white shorts and a day-long riding trip. Delilah got her period and her boobs when we were eleven, naturally. After a few days of niceties and shared lunches, I asked about Marissa and Yvonne. Delilah curled her lip in disgust. We went on a group date with my cousin and his friends, and they were such babies. It's not that I had forgotten what happened the year before, but I was willing to look past it. Having Sam meant I didn't feel the same kind of pressure to please Delilah, didn't take her quite so seriously, although I was determined never to be such a baby. Besides, being friends with Delilah meant no more lunches alone, no more feeling like a complete loser. And while I wouldn't ever describe her as nice, Delilah was funny and smart. She chose crushes for both of us, saying that high school boys were much cuter, but we needed practice before we got there. Mine was Kyle Houston, who had both the colouring and personality of mashed potatoes. For his part, Kyle didn't seem too interested, either. That is, until he copped a feel at the dance. Sam and I had a never-ending email chain, but it wasn't until Thanksgiving that I saw him in the flesh again. Sue had invited us to join them for turkey dinner, and my parents had happily accepted. They may not have been sure about Sue when they first met her, but I could tell they'd warmed up to her. They had her over for coffee a couple of times the previous summer, and I heard mom telling dad about how impressed she was that Sue was raising those two nice boys on her own and how she must have a keen business sense to have made the tavern such a big success. Sam warned me that his mom tended to overdo it for holidays ever since his dad passed away. She wouldn't hear of my parents bringing any food, either. So we showed up carrying wine and brandy and a bouquet of flowers mom and I had picked out at the grocery store. The sun was low in the sky and the Florex house looked like it was glowing from within. The smell of turkey wafted out to us as we stepped onto the porch, and the door swung open before we even knocked. Sam stood in the doorway, his thick shag of hair combed into submission and parted to one side. I could hear your footsteps on the gravel, he said, seeing the surprised expressions on our faces. Then he added an uncharacteristically chirpy, happy thanksgiving, and held the door open with one arm, stepping to the side to let us in. May I take your coats, Mr. and Mrs. Fraser, he asked. He wore a white button-down shirt tucked into khaki pants, which made him look like a busboy at my parents' favorite French restaurant. Certainly. Thank you, Sam, Dad said. But Diane and Arthur will do just fine. Hey, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Sue greeted my parents, her arms held wide, while I put the gifts I was holding on the floor and took off my coat. May I take that? Persephone. Sam asked with exaggerated graciousness, extending his arm for my coat. Why are you talking like that? I whispered. Mom gave us a big speech about being on our best behavior. She even played the make your dad proud card. He was big on manners, he said quietly. 
you look lovely, this evening, by the way, he added in an overly enthusiastic tone. I ignored his comment, though I had made extra effort, brushing my hair out so it shone and wearing my crushed velvet burgundy dress with the puffed sleeves. Well, cut it out, I said. That voice you're using is giving me the creeps. Got it. No weird voice. He smirked, then crouched to pick up the bottles and flowers from the floor. When he stood, he leaned closer and said, I mean it, though. You do look nice. His breath on my cheek made me blush, but before I could respond, Sue had me in a hug. It's so good to see you, Percy. You look beautiful. I thanked her, still reeling from Sam's comment, and waved at Charlie, who stood behind her. Red's your color, puss, he said. He had on a pair of black dress pants and a shirt that matched the pale green of his eyes. I didn't realize you knew how to fully dress yourself, I replied. Charlie winked, and then Sue ushered us into the living room, where a fire crackled in the stone hearth. While Sue finished in the kitchen, Sam passed trays of cheese and bowls of nuts, and Charlie took drink orders, offering Mom a gin and tonic and asking Dad if he wanted red, it's a Pinot Noir, or white wine, Sauvignon Blanc. My parents looked both impressed and amused. Restaurant kid was all Charlie said by way of explanation. Sue joined us when everything was just about ready and had a drink with my parents. She was more made up than usual, in a fitted black turtleneck and capri pants. She had her blonde hair down around her shoulders and wore a rose-colored lipstick. It had the effect of making her look both older and more beautiful. My own mom wasn't unattractive, she kept her dark straight hair in a neat bob and had strange rust-colored eyes, and she was fashionable. But Sue was pretty pretty. By the time we sat down for dinner, our faces were flushed from the fire and the overlapping conversations. Charlie and Sam brought out platters and dishes and bowls of sides and sauces, and Sue carried the turkey to the head of the table and carved it herself. The boys dug in with impressive speed, manners abandoned, and my parents watched, slack-jawed. You should see my grocery bills, Sue laughed. I sat next to Sam, and when I reached for a second helping of potato casserole, he gave me a stunned look. You're not wearing your bracelet? he said quietly, his fork suspended midway to his mouth, a piece of dark meat speared on the end. Ah, no, I replied, watching the hurt flicker in his eyes. I felt self-conscious wearing it around Delilah, but I couldn't say that right now. I still have it, though. It's in my jewelry box at home. You're cold, P.E.R.S. Sam never takes his off. Charlie cut in and the chatter that had been swirling around us stopped. He freaked when Mom wanted to wash it. Thought it would get ruined in the washing machine. It would have, Sam said flatly, streaks of crimson painting his cheeks. We hand-washed it, and it was fine, Sue said, either not picking up on the tension between the two boys or ignoring it altogether. She went back to chatting with my parents. Jerk, Sam mumbled under his breath looking down at his plate. I leaned in closer and whispered, I'll wear it next time. I promise. M.O.M. and Dad let me invite Delilah to the cottage for the first week of the summer. On the last day of June, the four of us rode up in my parents' new overstuffed SUV. My knees were bouncing with anticipation by the time we turned down Bear Rock Lane, and there was a huge, stupid smile across my face. The cottage needed more work before we visited in winter, so I hadn't seen Sam since Thanksgiving, seven months ago. What's with you? Delilah whispered across a stack of luggage. You look deranged. I had sent Sam and I am with our estimated time of arrival the night before we left, another when we were packing the car, and another just before we pulled out of the driveway. He hated Ims and responded to precisely none of them. Still, I knew he'd be waiting for us when we arrived. But I wasn't prepared to see two very tall figures standing outside the cottage. Is that them? Delilah hissed, pulling a tube of lip gloss out of her pocket. Yeah? I said, not totally believing it. Sam was tall. 
like really tall. I was out the door before Dad shut off the engine and flung myself at him, stretching my arms around his slim torso. His wiry arms came around me, and I could feel him shake with laughter. I pulled back with a big smile. Hi, Percy, he said, his eyebrows raised high under his uncombed hair. I paused at the sound of his voice. It was different. It was deep. I quickly pushed aside my shock and grabbed his arm. Update 1, I said, holding my wrist next to his, lining up our bracelets side by side. Haven't taken it off since after Thanksgiving, I added. We grinned at each other like lunatics. This way we'll have something to swear on, I said. Thank God. It was my number one concern. Sarcasm oozed from Sam's words like caramel from a chocolate egg. He was pleased. Hey, puss, Charlie said from over Sam's shoulder, then called to my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Fraser, Mom sent us over to help unload. Appreciate it, Charlie, Dad hollered, his head in the trunk of the SUV. But drop the Mr. and Mrs. thing, okay. I'm Delilah, said a voice behind me. Whoops. I had completely forgotten my friend. A small part of me okay, fine, a rather large chunk didn't want to introduce Delilah to Sam. She was so much cuter than me, and her boobs had gotten huge this year while I remained flat-chested. I knew it wasn't like that between Sam and me, but I didn't want it to be like that between them, either. Sorry, I'm being totally rude. I apologized. Sam, this is Delilah. Delilah, Sam. They exchanged hellos, though his was noticeably cold. Sam had replied with exactly three words when I emailed him about my rekindled friendship with Delilah, are you sure? I was, but evidently, Sam was not. You must be Charlie, Delilah called out, homing in on him like a fox on a baby chick. Yeah, hey, Charlie said as he walked by carrying a box of groceries, paying her zero attention. Unruffled, she turned back to Sam, her big blue eyes twinkling. She was wearing the tiniest pair of coral shorts and a skin-tight yellow tube top that showed off her boobs and stomach. Percy didn't mention how cute you are, she said, lavishing upon him one of her signature beaming smiles, all glossy pink lips and fluttering lashes. Sam's face scrunched up and his eyes darted to mine. Sorry, I mouthed, then grabbed Delilah's arm and pulled her toward the car as she giggled. Can you come over later? Sam asked after we finished unloading. I've got something I want to show you. It's updates one, two, and three. The way he spoke, like Delilah wasn't there, filled my chest with helium. You haven't told her about the boat yet? Charlie asked. Sam rubbed his face and pushed his hair off his forehead in one movement of controlled agitation. No, it was going to be a surprise. Shit, sorry, man, Charlie said, and to his credit, he sounded like he meant it. Well, fill us in, Delilah piped up, her hands on the racetrack curves of her hips. We fixed up Dad's old boat, said Sam in a baritone of pride. His voice would take some getting used to. And he means old, Charlie added. It used to be our granddad's, and Dad fixed it up and kept it going until. Sam's sentence hung there. It's just been sitting in the garage, Charlie cut in. Mom always promised I could use it once I turned 16, but it needed a bunch of work. Grandad helped repair it this spring when they got back from Florida. Even got this guy helping out. Charlie bumped Sam with his elbow. You've got to see it, Percy, said Sam with a crooked smile. It's classic. Delilah tossed her hair behind a pale shoulder. We'd love to. Oh my god, Percy. Delilah squealed as soon as we took our suitcases up to my bedroom. Why did you not tell me how hot Charlie is? I would have worn something way cuter than this. I laughed. Delilah had become seriously boy crazy over the past year. 
Sam's not as good looking, but he's cute, too, she said, staring up at the ceiling as though in careful thought. I bet he'll be just as hot when he gets older. The taste of jealousy was bitter on my tongue. I didn't want her thinking Sam was cute. I didn't want her thinking about Sam at all. He's okay, I guess. I shrugged. Let's pick our outfits for when we go over this afternoon. She was already opening her suitcase. It's just Sam and Charlie. Trust me, they don't care how we're dressed, I said, but now I wasn't entirely sure that was true. She looked at me skeptically. I'll be wearing my bathing suit and my shorts if it makes any difference to you, I added. We changed into our swimsuits after unpacking our things. Delilah put on a black string bikini, impossibly held together with flimsy ties, and wiggled into a pair of fresh white denim cutoffs so short the smile of her as cheeks grinned out the bottom. What do you think? She turned around, and I tried not to stare at her chest, but it was kind of impossible, considering the ratio of breast to bathing suit. You look insane, I said. Good insane. I meant it, but the acid burn of envy was spreading down my throat. Mom refused to let me wear a string bikini, but she had allowed a two-piece neon orange with wide buckled straps on the top. I thought it was cool at the store, but now I felt childish, and my jean shorts seemed entirely too full-bottomed. We padded down the stairs to the lake. The sky was clear and the water was blue-blue, rippling from a breeze coming from the southeast. There was a bright yellow motorboat at the Florex dock, and the tops of Charlie's and Sam's heads were visible as they poked around inside. Nice boat! I yelled, and they sprung up like meerkats, both shirtless and bronzed. The perks of living by the lake. I can see Charlie's muscles from here, Delilah shrieked. I shushed her. Sound carries easily on the water. But she was right. Charlie had filled out, and there was more definition to his arms, chest, and shoulders. Wanna come see? Sam yelled back. Do we ever, Delilah purred, and I elbowed her and raised my hand in a thumbs up. We cut through the trail between our properties, emerging from the woods a few meters from their dock. Isn't it great? Sam beamed at me from the boat. Isn't she great? Charlie corrected. It's awesome. I said, and meant it. The boat had a rounded nose with brown vinyl benches in the front and room for six more in the back. Totally retro, Delilah enthused as we walked onto the dock. Whoa, whoa, P.E.R.S. Charlie held his hands up. Your bathing suit plus this boat? I was going to take us for a drive but I'm not sure I'll be able to see. I scowled at him. Hilarious, Sam said, then ran his eyes over me. That suit's really cool. Matches the orange in the bracelet. Hop in. Sam reached out his hand to help me, and a hot current of electricity buzzed from my fingers to my neck. What was that? We call it the banana boat, for obvious reasons, Sam said, unaware of the zap he'd sent up my arm. We haven't even shown you the best part. Charlie pushed down on the wheel and a loud awooga sounded from the horn. Delilah and I jumped and then cackled with laughter. Oh my god! This is a horny sounding boat, she cried. Gives new meaning to the name Banana Boat, huh? Sam grinned at her and the electricity that had been running up and down my arm faded. Once we got the okay from my parents, who were already sitting on the deck with glasses of wine in hand, Charlie drove us south to a little cove and cut the motor. This, ladies, is the jumping rock, he declared, dropping an anchor into the water and removing his t-shirt. I was trying very hard not to stare at his new stomach muscles. I was failing. It's totally safe to jump, Sam said. We've been doing it since we were kids. Who's in? asked Charlie. I'll do it. Delilah said, standing to unbutton her shorts. 
I had been too distracted to notice the rocky cliff we'd pulled in front of. I blanched. You don't have to, Sam said to me. I'll stay in the boat with you. I stood and took off my shorts. I would not be a baby. We dove off the end of the boat and swam toward shore, Delilah and me following Sam and Charlie up the side of the cliff. I screamed when Charlie sprinted toward the edge and jumped over without warning. We crept up to the edge to see his head bobbing in the water, his dimples clear even from this height. Who's next, he called. I'm going, Delilah announced, and Sam and I stepped back to give her space. She moved back from the edge and then took three huge strides before jumping off. She came out of the water laughing. That was amazing. You've got to try it, Percy, she yelled. My stomach twisted. It seemed a lot higher from up here than it did from the boat. I looked behind me, thinking that maybe I'd just walk down. Want to go back the way we came? Sam asked, reading my mind. I scrunched my mouth up. I don't want to be a chicken, I admitted, looking back over the lake and down to Charlie and Delilah. No, I get it, it's really high, Sam said surveying the water below. We could go together. I'll hold your hand, and we'll jump on the count of three. I took a deep breath. Okay. Sam threaded his fingers through mine. Together, on three, he said, squeezing my hand tight. One, two, three. We dropped like concrete, our hands separating when we crashed through the surface. I was pulled down, down, down like an anvil was tied to my ankle, and for a fraction of a second, I worried I wouldn't make it back up. But then the downward momentum stopped and I kicked, swimming up to the light overhead. I came out gasping for air at the same time Sam emerged, spinning around to look for me. He wore a full toothy smile. You okay? Yeah, I gasped, trying to catch my breath but I am never doing that again. What about you, Delilah? Charlie asked. Want to go again? Definitely, she said. As if there would be another answer. Sam and I swam back to the boat, using the little ladder at the back to haul ourselves up. He passed me a towel and we sat on the benches at the front across from each other, drying off. Delilah's not as bad as I thought he said. Oh, really? Yeah, she seems kind of silly. But I still have my eye on her. If she says one mean thing to you, I will have to exact my revenge. His hair dripped onto his shoulders, which didn't look quite as bony as they used to. I've been plotting it since you told me about her. It's all planned out. I laughed. Thanks for defending my honor, Sam Florek but she's not like that anymore. He eyed me silently, then moved to the bench beside me, our thighs pressed together. I wrapped my towel around my shoulders, very aware of how my skin prickled where it met his. I barely registered the splashes of Charlie and Delilah's second jumps. What's in your hair? he asked, reaching for the section I had wrapped in embroidery floss. Oh, I forgot that was there, I said. I did it to match the bracelet. Do you like it? When he turned his focus from my hair to my face, I was caught off guard by how stunning the blue of his eyes was. It wasn't like I hadn't noticed before. Maybe it was that I hadn't seen them this close up. He looked different from the last time I saw him, his cheekbones more prominent, the space below them hollower. Yeah, it's cool. Maybe I'll grow my hair out this summer and you can do it to match my bracelet too, he said. He searched my face, and the prickling where his leg pressed against mine became a campfire blaze. He tilted his head and pursed his lips. The bottom one was fuller than the top, a faint crease bisected the pink crescent. I hadn't noticed that before. You look different, Sam murmured, squinting while he examined me. No more freckles, he said after a few seconds. Don't worry, they'll be back, I said, looking up at the sun. 
probably by the end of the day. One corner of his lip rose slightly, but his brows remained furrowed. No more bangs, either, he said, giving the embroidered section of her a gentle pull. I blinked back at him, my heart pounding. What is even happening right now? No, and they won't be back ever, I replied. I lifted my hand to tuck my hair behind my ear, realized it was shaking, and wedged it safely under my thigh. You know, you're the only boy I've met who pays such close attention to hair. I tried to sound calm, but the words came out wearing a straitjacket. He grinned. I pay attention to a lot of things about you, Percy Fraser. The Canada Day fireworks were an impressive display for such a small town. They were lit from the town dock, explosions illuminating the night sky and glittering on the inky water below. Do you think Charlie's friends are as cute as he is? Delilah asked, tossing clothes all over the floor while we got ready. The plan was for Charlie, Sam, and Charlie's friends to pick Delilah and me up in the banana boat at dusk so we could watch from the lake. Knowing Charlie, I think his friends are probably all girls, I replied, pulling on a pair of sweatpants. And then I'll have to go all out. She held up a red halter top and a black miniskirt. What do you think? I think you'll be cold. It can get chilly when the sun goes down. She gave me a devilish grin. I'll risk it. Thus clad she in club wear, me in a navy U of T sweatshirt dad bought at the university gift shop, we made our way to the water. We stopped dead as soon as we got to our dock and looked over at the Florex. Charlie and another boy were helping three girls into the boat. I took comfort in the fact that they were dressed more like me than Delilah, in leggings and pullovers. Charlie brought the boat up to the end of our dock so we could climb aboard and introduced us to the group. Delilah's face fell when he referred to Artie as his girlfriend, but she quickly collected herself and planted her butt on the bench next to Sam. I sat across from them, my eyes sticker glued to where Delilah's leg pressed against his. Charlie parked just out from the town beach, where dozens of boats drifted on the water and cars lined the shore all around the bay. Charlie's friend Evan cracked a couple of cans of beer and passed them around as we waited. Both Charlie and Sam declined, but Delilah took a sip, puckering at the taste. You won't like it, Percy, she said, handing it back to Evan. I took advantage of the dimming light to study Sam. He was listening to Delilah talk about her summer plans, horse riding in the Kawarthas and sun tanning at a resort in Muskoka. His hair was thick and unruly, as usual, and he kept pushing it back only for it to fall over his eye again. He had a good mouth, I decided. His nose was the exact right size for his face, not too small or too big. It was kind of weirdly perfect. I already knew he had the best eyes. His whole face was nice, really. He was skinny, but his elbows and knees didn't look as stabby as they did last summer. Delilah was right, Sam was cute. I just hadn't realized before now. I sat quietly with my revelation as he nodded along to Delilah's description of the resort pool, large hands wrapped around his knees, thighs squished against hers. You cold? he asked her. A bit, she admitted. She was shivering, I could see that, but when Sam unzipped his black hoodie and passed it to her, it felt like a blade had been plunged into my belly. It struck me like a bus. I had no idea how much time Sam spent with other girls during the year. I didn't think he had a girlfriend, but then again, the topic hadn't come up. And Sam was cute. And smart. And thoughtful. You okay, Percy, he asked, catching me staring wide-eyed. Delilah shot me a funny look. Aha! Uh -huh. It came out of my mouth as an odd squeak. I needed a diversion. Hey, Evan. I wouldn't mind a sip of that, I said, pointing to his beer. Yeah, sure. He passed me the can, and nope. I did not like beer. I gave Evan a smile after my first gulp, then forced back two more before handing it back. Sam leaned toward me, his lips pinched together. 
You drink beer, he asked with clear disbelief. Love it, I lied. He frowned. Swown it? He held up his wrist. Not a chance. He shook his head and laughed, and the sound brought a smile to my face. Delilah's gaze ping-ponged between us, and when the fireworks started, booms echoing around the bay, she moved onto the seat beside me, linked her arm through mine, and whispered in my ear, your secret's safe with me. The weather had been perfect for Delilah's visit, clear skies, not a drop of rain, hot but not muggy, as if Mother Nature had known Delilah was coming, and put on her most impressive outfit. To Delilah's great disappointment, Charlie wasn't as cooperative, spending most of his time working at the tavern or hanging out at Artie's house in town. Her last day at the lake was what Dad called a scorcher, and when we could no longer walk on the dock without burning our feet, we headed to the Florex basement. What's Charlie up to? Delilah asked as the three of us trudged down the stairs with sodas and a bag of salt and vinegar chips. Sleeping, probably, said Sam, grabbing the remote. What do you feel like watching? He and I took our usual spots at the opposite ends of the couch. I've got a better idea, Delilah said with a toss of red hair. Let's play truth or dare. Sam groaned. I don't know. I hesitated, feeling uneasy. I'm not sure we have enough people to play. Of course we do. You can play with just two people and there are one, two, three of us. Sam eyed Delilah like she was a poisonous snake. Come on. It's my last day. Let's do something fun. Just for a little while? I directed my question at Sam. Okay, sure, he sighed heavily. Delilah clapped her hands and positioned us in a circle on the sisal carpeting. We don't have a bottle, so let's just spin the remote to see who goes first. Whoever the top end is facing starts, she directed. Sam, why don't you go for it? If I must, he said from under a swoop of tawny hair. He spun the remote, which pointed vaguely in Delilah's direction. Delilah, truth or dare? Sam asked with the enthusiasm of a dead trout. Truth. Sam locked his blue eyes on her like a missile, have you ever bullied anyone? I shot him a warning glance, but Delilah was oblivious. That's a weird question, she said, her bubblegum lips in a twist. But, no, I haven't. Sam raised one eyebrow, but let it slide. Okay, my turn to ask one, she said and rubbed her hands together. Sam, do you have a girlfriend? I do not, he replied, sounding utterly bored and a bit condescending. I fought back a smile that started in my fingertips, and let out the breath I'd been holding since the night of the fireworks. After fifteen otherwise dull minutes of answering truth questions, Sam rubbed his face and moaned, can we put an end to this if I choose dare? Delilah considered this until a look of evil victory fell across her creamy face. Great idea, Sam. She pretended to think, her index finger on her chin. Then she narrowed her eyes at him. I dare you to kiss Percy. My jaw slowly dropped. I'd been trying to figure out how I felt about Sam for days. But the glare he was giving Delilah, like he wanted to chop her up in itty bitty pieces, was a flashing billboard that read I would only kiss Percy Fraser if she were the last girl in the galaxy, and maybe not even then. My stomach lurched. What, don't you think she's cute enough for you? Delilah asked, her voice as sweet as a spartame, just as footsteps came down the stairs. Who's not cute enough for you, Samuel? Charlie asked, stalking over to us in a pair of black track pants. He stretched up into a yawn that drew attention to his naked torso. No one, Sam replied as Delilah said, Percy. Charlie tilted his head toward her, his green eyes twinkling with delight. Oh? I dared him to kiss her but he obviously wasn't going to. I'd be insulted if it were me, she said, like I wasn't sitting right beside her. Is that right? 
Charlie smirked. How come, Samuel? Get lost, Charles, he muttered, a high tide of blood red rising past his neck. Well, I wouldn't want Percy to feel bad just because you don't have the balls to kiss her, Charlie said. He bent down, took my face in his hands, and moved his mouth over mine before I had a chance to react. His lips were soft and warm and tasted of orange juice, and he pressed them to me long enough that I felt awkward with my eyes open. Then it was over. He pulled back a few inches, his hand still on my face. You snooze, you lose, Sam, Charlie said, looking at me with his cat eyes. He winked and straightened to full height, then headed back upstairs, leaving behind the spicer-sharp smell of his deodorant. Whoa, Percy! Delilah grabbed my arm. I ran my tongue over my lips, the citrus tang lingering on them. Earth to Persephone, she giggled. Sam watched me silently, pink to the tips of his ears. I blinked away and bent my head, covering my face in a dark force field of hair. I'd just had my first kiss, but my mind was stuck on the fact that Sam didn't want to kiss me. Not even on a dare. MOM drove Delilah back to the city the next morning. Delilah gave me a hug, saying she had the best time ever and was going to miss me so much. I was relieved she was gone. I wanted Sam to myself so things could go back to normal, and I could forget about Charlie kissing me and Sam very much not kissing me. The going back to normal part was easy. We swam. We fished. We read. We made our way through 80s horror movies. Forgetting about the kissing stuff. Not so much. At least not for me. For Charlie, it wasn't a problem. I'm not sure he remembered putting his lips on mine at all, it's possible he was half asleep or sleepwalking at the time, because he didn't mention it. I was sitting in the banana boat mulling all this over while Charlie and Sam dried off from our latest trip to the jumping rock. I stayed in the boat in a more supervisory capacity. It's not that I wanted Charlie to mention the kiss again. I just kind of wanted some reassurance that I wasn't a completely crappy kisser. I was studying Charlie's mouth when I felt a tug on my bracelet. It was Sam, and I was busted. When we got back to the Florex, Sam and I swam out to the raft while Charlie went to get ready for his shift at the restaurant. As soon as we climbed on, Sam lay down with his hands behind his head and face to the sun, closing his eyes without a word. What the hell? He'd barely spoken to me since he caught me leering at his brother, and suddenly I was irrationally annoyed. I backed up to give myself a running start and cannonballed into the water next to where he was lying. His legs were covered in droplets when I emerged, but he hadn't moved an inch. You're quieter than usual, I said. Once I'd climbed back onto the raft, standing over him so water dripped onto his arm. Oh yeah? His voice was dispassionate. Are you mad at me? I glared at his eyelids. I'm not mad at you, Percy, he said, slinging one arm over his face. Okarari. Well, you seem kinda mad, I barked. Did I do something wrong? No response. I'm sorry for whatever it was, I added with an edge of sarcasm. Because, reminder, he was the one who rejected me. Still nothing. Frustrated, I sat down and pulled the arm from his face. He squinted at me. Percy, I'm not. Seriously, he said. And I could tell he meant it. I could also tell that something wasn't right. Then what's going on with you? He pulled his arm out of my hand and hoisted himself up, so that we were both sitting cross-legged across from each other, knees touching. He tilted his head just slightly. Was that your first kiss? he asked. I stammered at the sudden change of topic. Kissing was not something we had discussed before. The other day. Charlie, he prodded. I looked over my shoulder for an escape route out of this conversation. Technically, I murmured, still looking at the water behind me. Technically. I sighed and faced him again, cringing. Do we have to talk about this? 
I know 14 is old for a first kiss, but... Charlie is such a dick, he interrupted with unusual sharpness. It's not a big deal, I said quickly. It's just a kiss. It's not like it matters or anything, I lied. Your first kiss is a big deal, Percy. Oh my god, I groaned, looking down to where our knees were touching. You sound like my mom. I studied the light hair that sprinkled his shins and thighs. Do you have your period? My eyes popped up to his. You can't ask me that. I screeched. He'd said it so casually, as if he'd ask do you like butternut squash. Why not? Most girls menstruate around 12. You're 14, he said matter-of-factly. I want to jump off the raft and never come up for air. I can't believe you just said menstruate, I muttered, my neck burning. My period had arrived smack dab in the middle of a school day. I stared at the red stain on my floral underwear for a full minute before pulling Delilah into the bathroom stall. For as much as I had obsessed about getting my period, I had no idea what to do. She ran to her locker and brought back a zippered pouch with pads and long tubes wrapped in yellow paper. Tampons. I couldn't believe she used them. She showed me how to put on the pad, then said, you're going to have to do something about these granny panties. You're a woman now. So, do you? Sam asked again. Do you have wet dreams? I snapped. I'm not telling you that, he said, his cheeks turning a deep magenta. I dug in. Why not? You asked me about periods. I can't ask you about wet dreams. It's not the same, he said, and his eyes flashed to my chest. We stared at each other. I'll answer your question if you'll answer mine, I hedged after several long seconds passed. He studied me, his lips pressed together. Swear on it, he asked. I swear, I promised and tugged on his bracelet. Yeah, I have wet dreams, he said quickly. He didn't even break eye contact. What do they feel like? Does it hurt? The question sprang from my lips without my say-so. He smirked. No, Percy, it doesn't hurt. I can't imagine not having control of my body like that. Sam shrugged. Girls don't have control of their periods, either. That's true. I'd never thought about that. But you have thought about wet dreams. He eyed me closely. Well, they sound pretty gross, I lied. Though not as gross as periods. Periods aren't gross. They're part of human biology, and they're actually pretty cool if you think about it, he said, his eyes wide with sincerity. They're basically the foundation of human life. I gaped at him. I knew Sam was smart I'd peeked at the report card that was tacked to the Florex fridge, but sometimes he said things like periods are the foundation of human life that made me feel years behind. You are such a nerd, I scoffed. Only you would say periods are cool, but believe me, they're gross. So you do have your period, he confirmed. Your deduction skills are outstanding, Doc, I said, lying down on my back and closing my eyes to put an end to the conversation. But after a few seconds he spoke again. They don't feel the same every time. I peered up at him, but his face was silhouetted by the sun. Sometimes I can feel it happening during a dream, and sometimes I wake up and it's already happened. I shielded my eyes with my hand, trying to make out his face. What do you dream about? I whispered. What do you think, Percy? I had a general sense of what boys found sexy. Blondes with big boobs. Sometimes, I guess, he said. Sometimes girls with brown hair he added quietly. The way he looked down at me made my insides feel like hot honey. What was your first kiss like? I asked. The answer suddenly felt urgent. He didn't speak for several long seconds, and when he did, it came out on a soft exhalation. I don't know. 
I haven't kissed anyone yet. The rumor at Deer Park High was that Miss George was a witch. The ninth grade English teacher was an older, unmarried woman whose thinning rust-colored hair was so brittle looking, I was tempted to try to snap off a piece. She dressed in flowing layers of black and arca that hid her tiny body, with pointer-toed high-heeled boots that laced up around her skinny calves. And she had this resin bracelet with a dead beetle encased inside that she assured us was real. She was strict and tough and a little bit scary. I loved her. On the first day of class, she handed out pastel-colored workbooks that were to serve as our journals. She told us journals were sacred, that she wouldn't judge their contents. Our first assignment was to write about our most memorable experience from the summer. Delilah looked at me and mouthed the words Charlie shirtless. Holding back a giggle, I opened the pale yellow book and began to describe the jumping rock. Writing in the journal quickly became my favorite part of ninth grade. Sometimes Ms. George gave us a theme to explore, other times she left it up to us. It felt good to give shape and order to my thoughts, and I liked using words to paint pictures of the lake and the bush. I wrote a full page about Sue's Pierages, but I also imagined terrifying tales of vengeful ghosts and medical experiments gone wrong. For weeks into the school year, Ms. George asked me to stay after class. Once the other students had filed out, she told me I had a natural talent for creative writing and encouraged me to enter a short story competition being held across the school board. Finalists would attend a three-day writer's workshop at a local college during March break. Polish up one of your horror narratives, dear, she said, then shooed me out the door. I took the journal to the cottage Thanksgiving weekend so Sam could help me decide which idea to work on. We sat on my bed with the Hudson's Bay blanket pulled over our legs, Sam flipping through the pages and my eyes stuck to him like a tongue to a metal pole in winter. Ever since Sam had told me he hadn't kissed anyone, I couldn't stop thinking about how I wanted to put my mouth on his before someone else got there. These are really good, Percy, he said. His face turned serious, and he gave me a there, their pat on my leg. You're such a sweet, pretty girl on the outside, but really you're a total freak. I grabbed the workbook from his hands and swatted him with it, but my brain had jammed on the word pretty. I mean it as a compliment, he laughed, holding his hands up to shield himself. I raised my arm to whack him again, but he grabbed my wrist and yanked me forward so that I tumbled on top of him. We both went still. My eyes moved to the little crease in his bottom lip. But then I heard footsteps coming upstairs and I scrambled off him. Mom appeared in the doorway, frowning behind her oversized red frames. Everything okay up here, Persephone? I think you should go with the brain blood one, Sam croaked after she left. M.O.M. and Dad said we could spend March break in Barry's Bay if I didn't get into the workshop, and for a second I wondered if maybe I shouldn't bother entering. I floated the idea to Delilah as we were walking home from school, and she pinched my arm. You've got better things to worry about than the summer boys, she said. I clutched her arm. Who are you and what have you done with Delilah Mason? I wailed. She poked her tongue out. I'm serious. Boys are for fun. Lots of fun. But don't let one stand in the way of your greatness. It took every ounce of my self-control not to double over with laughter. But that was that. I worked on the story throughout the fall. It was about an idyllic-seeming suburb where the smartest, most attractive teenagers were sent away to an elite academy. Except that the school was actually a nightmarish institution where their brain blood was harvested to formulate a youth-giving serum. Sam helped me work through the details over email. He poked holes in the plot and the science and then brainstormed solutions with me. Once I finished, I mailed him a copy with a signed cover page in a dedication to him for always knowing just the right amount of blood. I called it Young Blood. Five days later, he phoned the house after supper time. I'm going to stop thinking about what we can do over March break, he said. There's no way you aren't going to win. We drove T.O. Barry's Bay on Boxing Day. The bush seemed like a different world than it was in summer, the birches and maples were bare and a foot of snow covered the ground, 
the sun bouncing off the crystals in tiny glittering specks. The pine boughs looked as if they were coated in diamond dust. One of the year-round residents had played our driveway and lit the fire, and the smoke billowed from the cottage chimney. It looked like a scene on a Christmas card. As soon as we unpacked, I bundled up in my red wool peacoat and put on my white boots with the fairy pom-poms and a knit hat and matching mittens. I grabbed the parcel I'd carefully wrapped for Sam and headed out the door. My breath hit the air in silvery puffs, and the wind bit my fingers through my mittens. I was shivering when I climbed up the Florex porch. Sue opened the door, surprised to see me. Percy! It's so good to see you, honey, she said, giving me a hug. Come in, come in it's freezing. The house smelled like it did at Thanksgiving of turkey and wood smoke and vanilla candles. Merry Christmas, Mrs. Florek. I hope you don't mind me coming over without calling. I have a present for Sam and wanted to surprise him. I figured he'd be home. I don't mind at all. You're welcome here anytime, you know that. His. She was interrupted by a chorus of agonized groans and then laughter. He's in the basement playing video games with a couple of friends. Take your things off and head down. I stared at her blankly. In theory, I knew Sam had other friends. He'd begun mentioning them more than when we first met, and I'd been encouraging him to put the homework aside and hang out with them. I'd just never met them. Do I want to meet them? Do they want to meet me? Do they even know I exist? Percy? Sue gave me an encouraging smile. Hang your coat up, okay? They're nice kids, don't worry. I walked down the stairs in my socked feet, and when I got to the bottom, I was met with three sets of surprised eyes. Percy! Sam said, standing up. I didn't think you were here yet. Tardie! I replied dipping into a half curtsy as the other two boys put their controllers down and got to their feet. Sam gave me a tight hug, just like he would if it were only the two of us. I closed my eyes briefly, he smelled like fabric softener and fresh air. He felt thicker, more solid. Oh man, you're cold, he said, pulling away. Your nose is bright red. Yeah, I don't think my stuff is warm enough for up north. Let me grab you a blanket, he offered, then left me standing in the middle of the room while he dug around in a chest. Hi, I said, waving to Sam's friends. Since Sam clearly doesn't know how to make introductions, I'm Percy. Oh, sorry, Sam said, handing me a multicolored patchwork afghan. This is Finn, he said, pointing to the one with unkempt black hair and round glasses. Finn was almost as tall as Sam. And this is Geordie. Geordie had dark skin and close-cropped hair. He was shorter than the other two but not as wiry. All three wore jeans and sweatshirts. The famous Percy. Nice to meet you, said Finn, smiling. So they do know about me. Bracelet girl, said Geordie with a smirk. Now we can finally see why Sam never hangs out with us in the summer. Because I'm clearly more interesting. I joked and curled up in the leather armchair while Finn and Geordie plunked back down on the couch and picked up the controllers. Sam sat down on the arm of the chair. Exactly, he said. Three updates? I asked. He pushed his hair back and gestured to the TV. New video game. And his shirt. New hoodie. He pointed to a pile of hockey skates. We made a rink on the lake. You're going to love it. He paused and adjusted the blanket on my lap. We've got extra winter gear you can borrow. Your turn. Um, I began, like I hadn't planned what I'd tell him. I got a laptop for Christmas. Mom brought an espresso machine up with us, so if you want to get into latte art, we've got you covered and I held back a smile I got into the writer's workshop. His face lit up, an explosion of blue eyes and white teeth. That's amazing. Not that I'm surprised, but still. It's a huge deal. 
I bet it was really competitive. I grinned up at him. Hey, congratulations, Finn said from the couch, giving me a salute. Yeah, Geordie chimed in. Sam told us about your story. Wouldn't shut up about it, actually. I raised my eyebrows, feeling lighter than popcorn. I told you I thought it was good, Sam said. He tilted his head toward the large gift in my lap. Is that for me? No, I replied, innocently. It's for Geordie and Finn. She's good, said Geordie, pointing his index finger at me before going back to the game. It's stupid, I added quietly, my eyes on Sam's friends. He followed my gaze. I got something for you, too, he said, and I saw Geordie elbow Finn. You did? It's upstairs, he said. Guys, we'll be back in a sec, he announced, and we padded up to the main floor. Sam pointed to the stairs leading to the second floor. In my room. I had been inside Sam's bedroom only a couple of times. It was a cozy space with navy blue walls and thick carpeting. Sam kept it tidy, the bed was made with a blue plaid duvet, and there were no piles of clothes on the floor or stray papers on his desk. Next to the bed was a bookshelf filled with comics, second-hand biology textbooks, and full sets of J.R. Tolkien and Harry Potter. A large black and white poster showing a sketch of an anatomical heart, with labels pointing to the various parts, hung on the wall. There was a new framed photo on his desk. I put the gift down and picked it up. It was a picture of Sam and me from my first summer at the lake. We were sitting at the end of his dock, towels wrapped around our shoulders, hair wet, both squinting into the sun, a barely detectable grin on Sam's face and a toothy one on mine. This is a good shot, I said. Glad you think so, he replied, opening up his top drawer and handing me a small present covered in brown paper and tied with a red ribbon. I opened it carefully, tucking the ribbon in the pocket of my sweatpants. Inside was a pewter frame holding the same photo. So you can take the lake home with you, he said. Thank you. I hugged it to my chest and then groaned. I really don't want to give you yours. This is so thoughtful. Mine is silly. I like silly, Sam said with a shrug and picked his present up from the desk. I bit my lip while he tore off the paper and examined the cartoon naked man on the operation board game lid. His hair fell over his forehead, making it hard to read his expression, and when he looked at me it was with one of his unreadable stares. Because you want to be a doctor? I explained. Yeah, I get that. Genius over here, remember? He smiled. Definitely the best gift I got this year. I exhaled in relief. Swear on it? He pinched my bracelet between his thumb and forefinger. I swear. But then his face scrunched up. I don't want this to sound bad, but I think that maybe sometimes you worry too much about what other people think. He rubbed the back of his neck and bent his head so that his face was level with mine. I mumbled something incoherent. I knew he was right, but I didn't like that he saw me that way. What I'm trying to say is that it doesn't matter what other people think about you, because if they don't like you, they're clearly morons. He was so close I could make out the darker flecks of blue in his eyes. But you're not other people, I whispered. His eyes flicked down to my mouth and I leaned a tiny bit closer. I do care what you think. Sometimes I think no one gets me the way you do, he said, the pink of his cheeks deepening to scarlet. Do you ever get that feeling? My mouth felt dry and I ran my tongue over my top lip. His gaze followed its path, and I could hear him swallow thickly. Yeah, I said, putting a shaking hand on his wrist, sure that he would close the gap between us. But then he blinked like he had remembered something important and straightened to his full height and said, I don't ever want to mess that up. 7. Now. Sam and I walk to the tavern after finishing our ice creams, and when we arrive at the back door, we stand looking at each other awkwardly, 
unsure of how to part. It's been so great to see you, I tell him, tugging at the hem of my dress and hating how phony my voice sounds. Sam must hear it, too, because he raises his eyebrows and jerks his head back just slightly. I was going to try to hit the liquor store before it closes, I say. There's a bottle of wine with my name on it. It's kind of a lot being back here. I wince. Why did I say that? How is it that I've seen Sam for all of an hour and the lock has come flying off my big mouth? Sam runs his hand over his face and then through his hair. Why don't you come in for a drink? Twelve years is a lot of time to catch up on. It doesn't escape my notice that he's already done the math. I shift on my feet. There's nothing more I want than to spend time with Sam, to just be near Sam, but I need some time to figure out what I'm going to say to him. I want to talk about the last time we saw each other. To tell him how sorry I am. To tell him why I did what I did. To come clean. But I can't go there tonight. I'm not prepared. It would be like going into the fight of my life without any armor. I look around the quiet side street. Come on, Percy. Save your money. Okay, I agree. I step into the dark kitchen behind him, and when he flicks on the lights, my eyes slide down the slope of his back to the curve of his butt, which is a very big mistake because it is a stupidly great butt. It is at this precise moment that he turns around, catching me mid ogle. Bah? I ask, feigning ignorance. I brush past him and through the dining room doors, turning on the lights in the main room. With my hand still on the switch, I take in the space. I have to blink a few times to process what I see because it's wild how little has changed. Pine planks cover the walls and ceiling, the floors are some kind of tougher wood, maple maybe. The effect is of being in a cozy cabin, despite the large size of the room. Historic photos of Barry's Bay hang on the walls along with antique logging axes and saws and paintings from local artists, including a few of the tavern itself. The stone fireplace sits where it always did, and the same family photo is placed on the mantel where it always was. I make my way over to it while Sam takes a couple of glasses from the shelf behind the bar. It's a framed shot of the Florex in front of the tavern, which I know was taken the day the restaurant opened. Sam's parents are wearing massive smiles. His dad, Chris, towers over Sue with one arm wrapped around her shoulder, holding her tight to his side. A toddler Charlie clutches his free hand. Sue is carrying an infant Sam, he looks about eight months old, his hair is so fair it's almost white, and his arms and legs are deliciously dimpled. I studied this photo countless times as a teen. I touch Sue's face now. She's younger than I am in this photo. I always loved this shot, I say, still examining the picture. I hear the gurgle of liquid being poured into glasses and turn to see Sam, adult Sam, watching me with a pained expression. I walk to the bar and put my hands on the counter as I take a seat in front of him. He passes me a generous tumbler of whiskey. You okay? I ask. You were right earlier, he says, his voice rough as gravel. It's a lot having you here. It kind of feels like I've been punched in the heart. My breath hitches. He lifts his glass to his lips and tosses his head back, downing its contents. I am suddenly 1000 degrees hotter and hyper aware of the dampness under my armpits and how my bangs are stuck to my forehead. There's probably a cowlick up there. I try to push them off my face. Sam. I begin, then stop, not sure what words come next. I don't want to do this now. Not yet. I raise my glass to my mouth and take a large sip. Sam's gaze is relentless. His ability to maintain eye contact was something I got used to after I first met him. And as we got older, that blue stare set fire to my blood, but now its pressure is overwhelming. And I know, I know, that I shouldn't find him attractive right now, but his dark expression and his hard jaw are unraveling me. He is undeniably gorgeous, even when he's a little intense. 
maybe especially so. I tip back the rest of the whiskey and gasp at the burn. He's waiting for me to say something, and I've never been able to evade him. I'm just not ready to open up our wounds now, not before I know whether we'll survive them a second time. I look down at my empty glass. I've spent twelve years thinking about what I would say if I ever saw you again. I grimace at my own honesty. I pause, counting for breaths in and out. I've missed you so much. My voice trembles, but I keep going. I want to make it better. I want to fix things. But I don't know what to say to do that right now. Please just give me a little more time. I keep my attention on my empty glass. I have both hands wrapped around it so he can't see them shake. Then I hear the soft pop of the bottle's cork. I glance up, my eyes wide with fear. But his are soft now, a little sad even. Have another drink, Percy, he says gently, filling the glass. We don't have to talk about it now. I nod and take a deep breath, grateful. Enes Joey, he says, touching his glass to mine and raising it to his lips, waiting for me to do the same. Together, we gulp down our drinks. His phone buzzes in his pocket. It's not the first time it's gone off this evening. He checks the screen and shoves it back in his shorts. Do you need to get that? I ask, thinking of Chantal and feeling a pang of guilt. I don't mind. No, they can wait. I'll switch it off. He lifts the bottle of whiskey. Another? Why the hell not? I attempt a smile. He pours more and then comes around the bar to sit on the stool beside me. We should probably take this one slowly, he says, tilting his glass. I ruffle my bangs with my fingers, partly from nerves and partly in the hope of making them somewhat presentable. You once swore you'd never get bangs again, Sam says, looking at me sideways. I turn in my seat to face him. These, I pronounce, are my breakup bangs. And, wow, am I drunk already? You're what? he asks, swinging to face me with a lopsided grin, brushing my legs with his in the process. I look down where his thighs bracket mine, then quickly back to his face. You know, break up bangs, I say, trying to enunciate as clearly as possible. He looks mystified. Women get new hairstyles when we get dumped. Or when we dump someone. Or sometimes just when we need a fresh start. Bangs are like the New Year's Eve of hair. I see, Sam says slowly, and it's clear what he means is I really don't see and also that's crazy. But a smile plays across his mouth. I try not to focus on the little crease in the middle of his bottom lip. Booze and Sam are a dangerous combination, I realize, because my cheeks are toasty and all I can think is how much I want to suck on that crease. So were you the dumper or the dumpy? he asks. I got dumped. Just recently. I try to focus on his eyes. Ah, shit. Sorry, Percy. He moves his head down to my level so he's right in my eye line. Oh god, did he notice I was staring at his mouth? I force myself to meet his eyes. He's wearing an odd stern expression. My face is burning. I can feel beads of perspiration forming above my upper lip. No, it's okay, I say, trying to subtly dab at the sweat. It wasn't that serious. We weren't together very long. I mean, it was seven months. Which is long for me, the longest for me, actually. But, like, not long for most grown-up people. Oh, good, I'm rambling now. And maybe slurring. Anyway, it's fine. He wasn't the guy for me. Ah, he says, and when I look back to him, he seems more relaxed. Not a horror fan. You remember that, huh? Delight tingles in my toes. Of course, he says with open, disarming honesty. I smile a huge, dopey, whisker-fueled smile. 
Who could forget being subjected to years of shitty scary movies? This is classic Sam, teasing but always gentle and never unkind. Excuse me. You loved my movies. I give him a playful punch on the arm, and, Jesus, his bicep is like concrete. I shake my fist, looking at him in disbelief. He wears a small grin as if he knows exactly what I'm thinking. I take a sip of whiskey to cut the tension that's closing in. Anyway, no. Sebastian definitely did not like horror movies, I say, and then I rethink this. Actually, I don't know. I never asked. And we never watched one together, so who knows. Maybe he loved them. I leave out the part about how I haven't told anyone I've dated about this odd passion of mine. That I don't even watch scary movies anymore. To Sam, my love of classic horror films was probably a basic biographical Percy fact. But to me, it was far too intimate a detail to reveal to any of the men I saw. And, more to the point, after that first summer at the lake, I've associated those films with Sam. Watching them now would be too painful. You're joking. Sam asks, clearly confused. I shake my head. Well, you're right, he murmurs. He's definitely not the guy for you. What about you? I ask. Still reading anatomy textbooks for kicks. His eyes grow wider, and I think his cheeks have gone darker under the stubble. I hadn't meant to bring up that particular memory. Of his hands and mouth on me in his bedroom. I didn't. I start, but he interjects. I think my textbook reading days are over, he says, giving me an out. But then he adds, calm down, Percy. You look like you've been busted watching porn. I let out a relieved sound that is halfway between a laugh and a sigh. We finish our drinks in a happy silence. Sam pours more. It's dark outside now, and I have no idea how long we've been here. We're going to regret this tomorrow, I say, but it's a lie. I would endure a two-day hangover if it meant I could have another hour with Sam. Do you stay in touch with Delilah, he asks, and I almost choke on my drink. I haven't spoken to Delilah in years. We're friends on Facebook, so I know she's some kind of political PR ace in Ottawa, but I pushed her away not too long after I messed everything up with Sam. My two biggest friendships, gone within months. Both because of me. I run my finger around the rim of my glass. We stopped being close in university, I say. The truth of this still stings, though it's not the whole story, not even close. I look at Sam to see if he can tell. He shifts his weight on the stool, looking uncomfortable, and takes a big drink. I'm sorry to hear that. You two were really tight for a while there. We were, I agree. Actually, I add, glancing up at him, you probably saw her more than I did since you both went to Queen's. He scratches the scruff on his jaw. It's a big campus, but yeah, I ran into her once or twice. His voice is coarse. She'd get a kick out of seeing how you've grown up, my stupid whiskey mouth blurts. I look down at my drink. Oh, he asks, bumping my knee with his. And how did I grow up? Cocky, apparently, I mutter, squinting at my glass, because somehow there are two of them. He chuckles and then leans toward me and whispers in my ear, you grew up pretty cocky, too. Sam sits back and studies me. Can I tell you something, he asks, his words running together just a little. Of course, I choke out. His eyes are slightly unfocused, but he has them set on mine. There was this incredible used book and video store in Kingston when I was pre-med, he begins. They had a huge horror section, all the good stuff you loved. But other movies, too. Obscure ones that I thought maybe you hadn't seen. I spent a lot of time there, just browsing around. It reminded me of you. Sam shakes his head, remembering. The owner was this grumpy guy with tattoos and a huge mustache. 
One day he got super pissed at me coming in all the time and never buying anything, so I grabbed a copy of The Evil Dead and plunked it on the counter. And then I just kept going back, but of course I had to buy something each time. I ended up with Carrie, Psycho, The Exorcist, and all those terrible Halloween movies, he says. He pauses, searching my face. I never put them on, though. My roommates thought I was nuts to have all these movies I didn't watch. But I just couldn't bring myself to. It felt wrong without you. This shakes me. I've spent hours, days, entire years wondering if Sam could possibly long for me the way I did for him. In some ways, it seemed like wishful thinking. In the months following our breakup, I left countless messages on his dorm room phone, sent text after text, and wrote email after email, checking to see how he was, telling him how much I missed him, and asking if we could please talk. He didn't respond to a single one. By May, someone else answered the phone and new student had moved into his room. I considered driving up to Barry's Bay, telling him everything, begging for forgiveness, but I thought he'd probably wiped me, my name, and all memory of us from his mind by that point. There's always been a small, hopeful part buried inside me that felt he must sometimes find his mind drifting to me, to us. He was everything to me, but I know the same was true for him. Hearing him talk about the video store dislodges that deeply hidden sliver of hope, just a little. I don't watch them, either, I admit in a whisper. No? No. I clear my throat. Same reason. We're looking at each other, unblinking. The tightness in my chest is almost unbearable. The temptation to lean into him, to show him what he means to me with my hands and my mouth and my tongue is almost impossible to ignore. But I know that wouldn't be fair. My heart is a stampede of animals escaping the zoo, but I sit still, waiting for his response. And then Sam smiles and his blue eyes glint. I can feel what's coming before he speaks, and I'm already smiling. I know you, I think. You mean you finally got decent taste in films? His smartest comment chases away the heaviness looming over us, and we both fall into a fit of laughter. Clearly the whiskey has taken its full effect because my cackles are broken up with hiccups, and tears are streaming down my face. I put my hand on Sam's knee to steady myself without realizing that I've touched him. We're still cracking up, and I'm taking big gasping breaths to try to calm down, when a woman's voice silences our outburst. Sam? I look up and Sam turns toward the kitchen doors, my hand falling from his knee as he shifts. In the doorway stands a tall blonde. She looks like she's around our age, but she's dressed immaculately in white sailor-style trousers and a matching sleeveless silk blouse. She's thin and crisp-looking, her hair pulled back into a low bun at the nape of her long neck. I am suddenly fully aware of how crumpled my red dress is and how disheveled my hair must be. Sorry to interrupt, she says, walking toward us, car keys clenched in one hand. Her expression is cool, and I feel rather than see her sizing me up because I'm looking to Sam in confusion. I tried calling you several times, she says, her hazel eyes oscillating between us. I met some of Sam's cousins when we were kids, and I'm trying to place this woman among them. Shit, sorry, he says, the words of his apology blurring together. We got a bit sidetracked. She purses her lips. Are you going to introduce us, she asks, waving toward me. She has the fair florette colouring but definitely not the warmth. Sam turns and gives me a crooked smile that doesn't reach his eyes. Percy, this is Taylor, he says. Cousin? I ask, but Taylor answers for him. Girlfriend. Sam is introducing me to Taylor. His girlfriend. Not his cousin. Sam has a girlfriend. Of course he has a girlfriend. How had I not considered this? He is a hot doctor. He's tall and he's got those eyes, and the messy hair is working for him. I'm pretty sure whatever hard surface he's keeping under his t-shirt would make me weep. 
The Sam I knew was also kind and funny and brilliant, too smart for his own good, really. And he's so much more than all that. He's Sam. Taylor is standing in front of us, her hands on her hips, looking fresh and stylish and imposing in her all-white outfit while I am sitting with my mouth hanging open. What normal person wears all white without getting some kind of stain on the front, anyway? Come to think of it, who wears dress pants and a matching silk top on a Thursday night in Barry's Bay? On any night in Barry's Bay? I want to squirt her with one of the restaurant's ketchup bottles. Taylor, this is Percy, Sam says as though he's mentioned me before, but Taylor looks at him blankly. Remember? I've told you about Percy, he prods. She had a cottage next door. We hung out all the time when we were kids. Hung out? Hung out? How cute, Taylor says in a way that makes it sound like she doesn't think our childhood hangouts are very cute at all. So you two are just catching up? She directs the question to Sam, but her eyes flash over to me, and I can see the assessment she's making, threat or no. My dress is wrinkled and possibly sweaty. There's an ice cream stain on my boob. And there's no way I don't smell like whiskey. Her shoulders relax a little, she doesn't think there's anything to worry about. Sam is saying something in response to Taylor, but I have no idea what because I'm suddenly so nauseated that I have to hold onto the counter. I need air. I start taking deep breaths. I I in one, two, three, four, and ooh you one, two. Three, four. The whiskey, which was warm and honey sweet moments ago, now tastes stale and sour in my mouth. Puking is a very real possibility. You all right, Percy? Sam asks, and I realize I've been counting out loud. He and Taylor are both looking at me. Millimeter him, I hum tightly. But I think the whiskey is catching up to me. I should probably go. It was nice meeting you, Taylor. I get down from my spot at the bar and take a step forward, and my foot catches on the leg of Sam's stool. I stumble right in front of Taylor, who, by the way, smells like a fucking rose garden. Percy. Sam grabs my arm, and I close my eyes for a brief moment to steady myself. You can't drive. I turn back to him, and he's got this look on his face like he feels sorry for me. I hate it. It's okay, I start. No, I mean, I know I can't drive. But it's okay because I didn't drive. I walked here. Walked. Where are you staying? We'll give you a ride, Sam offers. We. 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 I look at Taylor, who is not doing a very good job at hiding her annoyance. Then again, if I found my hot doctor boyfriend drunk with a strange, clumsy woman who thought I was his cousin, I would be annoyed, too. And if that boyfriend were Sam, annoyance wouldn't cover it. I would be murderous. Clearly you both need a drive, Taylor says. Let's go. My car's out back. I follow Taylor and Sam. I can picture them together on a date, both tall and fit and stupid good-looking. She could be a ballet dancer, with her willowy limbs and her hair pulled back in that neat bun. He's built like a swimmer, broad through the shoulders, narrow at the hips, with legs that are muscular but not bulky. His calves look cut from marble. He probably still runs. They probably run together. They probably run together and then have the kind of sweaty, post-run sex that fit, happy people have. Taylor leads the way out the kitchen door and Sam holds it open for me to pass through. I wait for him to lock up while Taylor slides into her white BMW. I notice that her handbag and loafers are also white. This woman probably shits white. You okay, he says quietly. I'm too drunk to think about how to answer his question with a convincing lie, so I smile at him weakly before walking to the car. I sit in the back feeling like a child and a third wheel and also very dizzy. So how did you two meet? I ask even though I really do not want to know the answer. What is wrong with me?
At a bar, of all places, says Taylor, giving me a look in the review mirror that tells me she doesn't spend a lot of time picking up guys over a few beers. The idea of Sam just being out in the world, out in bars, looking for women to meet, is so horrifying that I need a moment to collect myself. It was, what, two and a half years ago, Sam. Two years. Two years is serious. Um, Sam offers by way of a reply. And what do you do, Taylor? I ask, quickly changing the subject. Sam looks over his shoulder, sending me a funny look, which I take to mean, what are you up to? I choose to ignore it. I'm a lawyer. Prosecutor. Are you kidding me? I squeak. I don't know if it's Sam or the alcohol that has so thoroughly removed my filter. A lawyer and doctor. That should be illegal. You two are, like, taking all the rich, hot people away from the rest of us. Oh, I am so very, very drunk. Sam erupts with a big, booming laugh. But Taylor, who clearly doesn't appreciate my inebriated sense of humor, remains quiet, giving me a puzzled look in the mirror. The drive is short, and we're at the motel in under five minutes. I point out room 106, and Taylor pulls up in front of it. I thank her for the drive in a cheery, possibly demented sounding, voice and, with zero grace, tumble out of the car and shuffle to the door, getting my key from my bag. Percy. Sam calls from behind me, and I close my eyes briefly before I turn around, the full weight of my humiliation pressing down on my shoulders. I want to crawl into bed and never wake up. He's rolled down the window and is leaning over his muscular forearm that's resting on the edge. We look at each other for a second. What? I say, my voice flat. I'm done pretending to be Perky Percy. I'll see you soon, okay? Sure, I reply and turn back to the door. Once I've got it unlocked, the headlights move, but I don't look back to see the car pull away. Instead, I run to the bathroom and throw my head into the toilet bowl. I lie eye in bed blinking up at the ceiling. I know it must be well into the morning because the sun is already high. I haven't turned my head to look at the clock because I don't want to wake the beast of a headache that lurks in my temples. My mouth tastes like I spent the night licking the floor of a roadhouse pub. Yet I smile to myself. I found Sam. And I felt it. The pull between us. The one that had been there since we were thirteen, the one that only got stronger as we got older, the one I tried to deny twelve years ago. I didn't break it. I broke us. I can fix it. And then she emerges through the fog of my hangover in a white pantsuit, Taylor. Bletch. I find a small petty pleasure in her name. Taylor is one of those used to be trendy names that now sound dated and pedestrian. My mother would find it vile. We met, what, two and a half years ago, Sam. I scrunch my nose at the memory of Taylor's forced casualness. I would be shocked if she didn't know how long they've been together down to the second. Sam has a girlfriend. A beautiful, successful, presumably intelligent girlfriend. Someone whom I'd probably like under different circumstances. I need a distraction. I chance tilting my head toward the clock and am relieved that the pounding doesn't get worse. I spot two purple chocolate bar wrappers on the bed beside me and remember taking them from the mini bar after I puked. It's 10.23. I groan. I should get up. I book today off, so I don't need to work, but I need to shower. Even I can smell me. Taylor probably wakes up in a pressed pantsuit. She probably keeps a bar of 75% fair trade dark chocolate in her kitchen drawer and eats a single square on special occasions. As much as I can mix with pretentious interior designers and architects, or recommend a trendy new restaurant that actually has good food and service, or spend the evening in heels without showing pain on my face, I'll always be messy underneath. Usually I do a good job of keeping that side of myself under wraps. 
But now and then it'll come out, like the time I called Sebastian's progressive seeming bearded best friend the worst kind of misogynist over dinner after he'd repeatedly looked down our server's shirt and asked me whether I'd go to part time or quit work entirely after I had children. Sebastian looked at me slack jawed, having never seen me snap like that, and I apologized for my outburst, blaming it on the wine. Still in yesterday's sundress, I ease out of bed and inch toward the bathroom. I'm stiff, but I'm not nauseated. I loosen my belt and pull the dress over my head, take off my underwear, and then step under the hot spray. As the soap and water lift the smog from my brain, I make a plan to head over to the public beach after breakfast. Sam and I never swam at the beach when we were young. Once or twice we bummed around the nearby park with his friends, but the beach was reserved for town kids who didn't live on the lake. I know there's no dock and no raft, but I am desperate for a swim. After my shower, I towel dry my hair until it's damp and run a comb through it. I chance a look at my phone. There's another text from Chantal, call Emmy. Instead, I write her back, hey. Can't talk right now. No need to come here. I'm okay. Ran into Sam yesterday. I can picture her rolling her eyes at my response. I know I'm probably not sneaking anything by her, and I feel guilty for not calling, but being here and seeing Sam yesterday feels so surreal, I can't imagine having to put it in words. I press send and then put on my bathing suit, a bright red two-piece that I have rare occasion to use, and a pair of denim shorts. I'm about to throw on a shirt before heading to the motel restaurant, when there's a knock at the door. I freeze. It's too early for housekeeping. It's me, Percy, says a deep, scratchy voice from outside. I unlock the door. Sam is looming in the doorway with damp hair and a fresh shave. He's wearing a pair of jeans and a white t-shirt, a coffee cup and a paper bag in one hand. It's every straight hungover woman's fantasy standing at the entrance of my room. He holds them out and then looks me over, slowing down over the one-shouldered bathing suit top I'm wearing. His blue eyes are somehow brighter today. Want to come to the lake? What are you doing here? I ask, grabbing the coffee and the bag. Never mind. I don't care why. You're my hero. Sam laughs. I told you I'd see you soon. I figured you'd forgive me for overserving you if I came bearing food, and I know you don't like sweets at breakfast. Or at least you didn't used to. Nope, still don't, I confirm, sticking my nose in the bag. Cheese and ham croissant. Brie and prosciutto from the new cafe in town, he replies and a latte. Barry's Bay is fancy now. I noticed a more refined day yesterday. I grin, taking a sip. Taylor won't mind if I come to the house. She might feel uncomfortable since we hung out all the time when we were kids. And this is the problem with seeing Sam before I've had time to figure out how to talk to him or at least before I've had coffee. Words come into my head and then out of my mouth with no lag time between it was that way when we were teenagers, and clearly that hasn't changed, no matter how much I've grown, no matter what kind of successful woman I've become. I sound petty and childish and jealous. Sam rubs the back of his neck and looks over his shoulder, thinking. In the two seconds it takes for him to shift his gaze back to me. I've melted into a sticky pool of embarrassment and reassembled myself into what I hope is a normal-seeming human. The thing about Taylor and me I cut him off with a frantic shake of my head before he finishes the sentence. I don't want to know about the thing with him and Taylor. You don't need to explain, I say. He stares at me blankly, blinking just once before pressing his lips together and nodding his head an agreement to move on. At any rate, something urgent came up with a case she's been working on. She had to go back to Kingston this morning. But the funeral is tomorrow. The words come out in a burst, thickly coated with judgment. Sam, rightfully, looks taken aback by my tone. Knowing Taylor, she'll find a way to come back. It's an odd response, but I let it slide. Shall we, he asks 
pointing his thumb over his shoulder at a red pickup truck I hadn't noticed until now. I look at him in shock. There's nothing about Sam that says red pickup truck, except for being born and raised in rural Ontario. I know, he says. It's Mons, and I started driving it when I moved up here. It's a lot more practical than my car. Living in Barry's Bay. Driving a truck. You've changed, Sam Florek, I say solemnly. You'd be surprised by how little I've changed, Persephone Fraser, he replies with a lopsided grin that sends heat where it should not. I turn around, discombobulated, and throw my towel and a change of clothes in a beach bag. Sam takes it from me and tosses it into the back of the truck before helping me climb in. Once the doors are closed, the rich smell of coffee mixes with the clean scent of Sam's soap. As he starts the engine, my mind begins racing. I need a strategy, ASAP. I told Sam last night I'd give him an explanation for what happened all those years ago, but that was before I met Taylor. He's moved on. He has a long-term relationship. I owe him an apology, but I don't have to unload my past mistakes on him to do it. Do I? You're quiet, Sam says as we head out of town toward the lake. I guess I'm nervous, I say honestly. I haven't been back since we sold. That Thanksgiving. He glances at me, and I nod. Silence falls over us. I used to twist my bracelet when I was anxious. Now I bob my knee up and down. When we turn onto Bear Rock Lane, I roll down the window and take a deep inhale. God, I missed this smell, I whisper. Sam puts his large hand around my knee, stopping its jitterbugging, and gives it a gentle squeeze before moving his hand back to the wheel and pulling into his driveway. 8. Summer, 15 years ago. My feet crunched on the driveway, the air heavy with dew and the lush smell of moss, fungi, and damp earth. Sam had taken up running in the spring, and he was determined to convert me to his cause. He mapped out an entire beginner's program to start today, my first morning at the cottage. I was instructed to eat a light breakfast no later than 7 a.m. and meet him at the end of my driveway at 8 a.m. I stopped when I saw him. He was stretching, his back turned to me with headphones in his ears, pulling one arm over his head and leaning to the side. At 15, his body was almost foreign to me. Somehow, he'd grown at least another six inches since I'd last seen him over the Christmas break. I'd noticed it yesterday, when he and Charlie came to help us unload. It's officially an annual tradition, I heard Charlie tell Dad. But I didn't have time to properly inspect Sam before both he and Charlie had to leave to get ready for their shifts at the tavern. Sam was working in the kitchen three nights a week this summer and I was already dreading the time apart. Now, his black running shirt lifted to expose a slice of tan skin. I watched, mesmerized, a flush creeping up my neck. His hair was the same thick tangle and he still wore the friendship bracelet around his left wrist, but he must have been well over six feet tall now, his legs stretched almost endlessly past the hem of his shorts. Almost as improbable as his height was that he was somehow thicker, too. His shoulders, arms, and legs all carried more bulk, and his butt was, well, it could no longer be mistaken for a frisbee. I tapped him on the shoulder. Jesus, Percy, he said, spinning around and taking off his headphones. Good morning to you, too, stranger. I wrapped my arms around his waist. Six months is too long, I said into his chest. He squeezed me tightly. You smell like summer, he said, then put his hands on my arms and stepped back. His gaze travelled over my spandex-clad form. You look like a runner. That was his doing. I had a drawer full of exercise gear based on the list of items he'd suggested. I had put on shorts and a tank top as well as a sports bra, which Sam had embarrassingly included on his list, and one of the cotton thongs Delilah gave me before she left for her mother-daughter European vacation which he had not included. My hair, now well past my shoulders, was gathered into a thick ponytail high on my head. 
fake it till you make it, right? He hummed and then turned serious and took me through a series of stretches. During my first squat, he stood behind me and put his hands on my hips. I almost tumbled backward with the shock of his grip. When I was suitably limber, he ran his hand through his hair and went over the plan. Okay, let's start with the basics. The most important part of learning to run is. He drifted off, waiting for me to fill in the blank. Good shoes. I guessed, looking down at my new Nikes. He shook his head, disappointed. Didn't you read the Couch to 5K article I mailed you? He'd clipped it from a running magazine, complete with some kind of complicated time and distance chart. I read it, once, ish. The most important part of learning to run is walking, he said with his hands on his hips. I smothered a giggle. This bossy thing was entirely new and sort of adorable and definitely funny. So we'll spend the first week doing a 3k out and back, increasing the distance you spend running each day until you're running the whole 3k by the end of the week. You'll take two rest days a week, and by the end of week two, you should be running a full 5k. I barely understood a word he'd said, but five kilometers sounded pretty far. How far do you usually go? To town and back. It's about 12k. My jaw dropped. I worked my way up to it. You will, too. Nope. No way. I cried. There are too many hills. Calm down. We'll take it day by day. He gestured down the road and started walking. Come on. We'll walk for the first five minutes. I looked at him dubiously, but picked up my pace to match his. If my elementary school's annual track and field day of hell hadn't already made it obvious years ago, it was now, I was not a natural runner. Ten minutes in, I was brushing sweat off my face and trying to ignore the fire in my lungs and thighs. Three updates. Sam asked without a hint of breathlessness. I scowled. No talking. He slowed his stride after that. At the halfway point, I took my top off, wiped my face with it, and tucked it into the back of my shorts. We walked the last leg of the route, my legs as shaky as a baby deer's. I never knew you were such a sweater, Sam said when I toweled off with my top again. I never knew you were such a masochist. This running thing was not adorable anymore. That writer's workshop really improved your vocabulary. I could hear the smirk in his voice. I hit him across the chest. The Florex drive came before hours, and I turned down it. I need to jump in the lake, like, right now, I said, cutting around the house and heading down the hill to the water with Sam beside me, a lopsided grin on his face. I don't know what you find so funny, I huffed. I'm not laughing. He raised his hands. I took off my shoes and socks as soon as we reached the dock, then peeled my shorts down and tossed them aside. Geese! Sam cried from behind me. I spun around. What? I snapped just as I realized I was wearing a pink thong and that Sam was staring at my extremely bare ass. I was too hot and pissy to care. Problem. I asked, and his eyes flashed to mine, then down to my bum, and then up to my face again. He muttered a fuck under his breath and looked skyward. He was holding both hands over his crotch. My eyebrows shot up. Not knowing what to do, I ran down the dock and cannonballed into the water, swimming under the surface for as long as I could. You coming in? I hollered back to him when I came up for air, a cocky grin plastered on my face. The water might cool you off. I'm going to need you to face the other direction before I do that, he called back, still shielding himself. And if I don't? I swam closer. Come on, Percy. Do me a favor. He looked truly pained, which served him right for subjecting me to his workout routine. But inside I was ecstatic. I paddled out to give him space while he jumped in. We were about six feet apart, treading water, 
and staring at each other. I'm sorry, he said, moving a bit closer. It's just my body's reaction. Body's reaction? Got it, I said, more than a little deflated. Half-naked chick equals erection. Basic biology. After our swim, Sam turned away when I climbed onto the dock. I lay on my back, letting the sun dry me off, my hands forming a cushion behind my head. Sam spread out beside me in the same position, his shorts sopping wet. I slanted my head toward him, and said, I think I should keep a bathing suit here for next time. I left one of my bikinis at the Florex, along with an extra towel, so I could jump into the lake as soon as we returned from the torture Sam called running. He swore I would grow to love it, but by the end of our second week, the only thing I had grown was a sprinkling of freckles across my nose and chest. We had just got back from a sluggish 5k, and I had grabbed my suit off the line, waved to Sue, who was weeding the garden, and popped inside to the bathroom to change while Sam did the same in his room. I tucked off my sweaty gear and tied on the string bikini mom had finally okayed, yellow with white daisies, then headed to the kitchen to wait for Sam. I was gulping down a glass of water at the sink when someone cleared their throat behind me. Good morning, sunshine. Charlie was leaning against the doorway wearing sweatpants and no shirt, his standard uniform. Not that I minded. Charlie was ripped for a 17-year-old. It's not even 9am, I panted, still out of breath. What are you doing up? Good question, Sam said, coming into the kitchen. He took the glass from my hands and refilled it. While Sam drank, Charlie looked me up and down without shame lingering on my chest. When his gaze reached my face again, his brows drew together over his green eyes. You look like a tomato, puss, he said, then turned to Sam. Why do you keep forcing your cardio on her? Bad hearts run in our family, not hers. Sam pushed his hair back. I'm not forcing her. Am I, Percy? He looked at me for backup, and I cringed. No, technically, you're not forcing me. I drifted off when Sam's expression crumpled. But you don't like it, Charlie finished, eyes narrowed at me. I like how it feels afterward, when it's over, I said, trying to find something positive to say. Charlie grabbed an apple from the fruit basket on the kitchen table and took a big bite. You should try swimming, puss, he said, his mouth full. We swim every day, Sam said in the monotone he reserved for when his brother annoyed him. No, like real distance swimming. Across the lake, Charlie clarified. Sam looked over at me, and I tried not to look too excited. I couldn't count the number of times I'd stared at the far shore and wondered whether I could ever make it across. It sounded awesome. That sounds interesting, I said. I can help you train if you want, Charlie offered. But before I could respond, Sam cut in, no, we're good. Charlie looked me over again, slowly. You'll need a different bathing suit. Training for swimming was way more fun than running. It was also a lot harder than I thought it would be. Sam collected me from the cottage every morning after his run, and we'd walk back to his place together so he could change into his suit. We devised a warm-up routine, involving a series of stretches on the dock and laps to and from the raft. Sometimes Sam swam beside me, giving pointers on my form, but usually he bobbed on a pool noodle. Charlie had been right about the bathing suit, too. During my first warm-up, I had to keep adjusting the top to keep everything from falling out. That afternoon, Sam drove us in the little boat to the town dock and we walked to Stedman's. It was half general store, half dollar store, and it had a little bit of everything, but there was no guarantee they'd have what you were looking for. As luck would have it, there was a rack of women's suits right at the front. Some had those old lady skirts attached to them, but there was also a handful of plain one piece in cherry red. Practical, cheap, and cute enough, the perfect Stedman's find. Sam found a pair of swim goggles in the sporting section 
and I paid for both with one of Dad's fifties. We spent the change on ice creams at the dairy bar, moose tracks for Sam and cotton candy for me and walked back to the dock, taking a seat on a bench by the water to finish the cones. We were looking over the lake quietly when Sam leaned over and circled his tongue around the top of my cone where it was melting in rivulets of pink and blue. I don't get why you like this so much, it tastes like sugar, Sam said, before he noticed the shock on my face. What was that? I asked. My voice came out an octave higher than usual. I tried your ice cream, he said. Which, okay, I know was obvious, but the way a current buzzed across my skin, he might as well have licked my earlobe. As my distances increased, Sam rode beside me in case I ran into trouble and as protection from other boaters. When I suggested he turn on the motor so he could relax, he brushed me off, saying I didn't need gasoline in my lungs while I swam. I practiced daily, dead set on making it to the other side of the lake by the end of August. The week before my big swim, I waited in the Florex kitchen for Sam to change into his bathing suit, helping Sue unload the dishwasher. Did he tell you he's lifting his dad's old weights every morning before his run? Sue asked me as she put a pair of glasses into the cupboard. I shook my head. He's really into the whole fitness thing, huh? Sue hummed. I think he wants to make sure he can pull you out if he needs to, she said, squeezing my shoulder. On the morning of the swim, I made my way down to the water. Mom and Dad following with mugs of coffee and an old school camera. When Sam came down to the dock, I walked over in my bare feet, holding my towel and goggles. Today's the day. How are you feeling? Sam asked from the boat when I padded onto the dock. Good, actually. I can do this. I beamed and threw my towel in with him. Good, good, he muttered checking around the boat for something. He seemed nervous. How are you feeling? I asked. He looked up at me and scrunched his nose. I know you'll do great, but I gotta admit I'm a little worried if something goes wrong. I hadn't heard Sam sound panicked before. But today he was panicked. I stepped down into the boat. The water's calm, you know CPR, you have an extra life jacket as well as a life preserver, there's a whistle in the boat to call for help, not that you'll need it since we have an audience. I pointed up to where my parents had joined Charlie and Sue on the deck, and waved at them. We're rooting for you, Percy, Sue called down. And, I continued, I'm an excellent swimmer. There's nothing to worry about. Sam took a deep breath. He looked a bit pale. I wrapped my finger around his bracelet. I swear, okay. You're right, he sighed. Just remember to take a break if you need to, you can always float for a bit. I patted him on the shoulder. So, should we do this thing? Let's, Sam said. I'd wish you luck, but you don't need it. Once I was in the water, I pulled my goggles on, gave Sam a thumbs up and then turned my attention to the far shore a small, rocky beach was my target destination. I took three deep breaths, then pushed off from the lake bottom with my feet and set off in a steady front crawl, my arms and feet working in tandem to propel me forward. I didn't rush my strokes, and soon the rhythm became almost automatic, my body taking over from my mind. I could see the side of the boat when I tilted my head for air, but I didn't pay it much attention. I was doing it. I was swimming across the lake. My lake. With Sam beside me. A rush of pride ran through me, powering me on and distracting me from the burning in my legs and the ache in my neck. I kept going, slowing down when I needed to catch my breath. I switched to breaststrokes for several minutes to relieve the tension building in my shoulders, then resumed the crawl. At times, I could hear Sam cheering me on, but I had no idea what he was saying. Every so often I'd raise a thumbs up in his direction to let him know I was okay. The closer I got, the stiffer my limbs began to feel. The ache in my neck and shoulders grew intensely, 
and I struggled to keep my focus on my breathing. I clenched my jaw against the pain, but I didn't stop. I knew I wouldn't. I was going to make it. And when I did, I pulled my body up on the sandy shore, flung my goggles aside, and lay with my head on my hands, my legs still in the water, breathing fire through my lungs. I didn't even hear Sam pull the boat up on the beach, didn't notice him until he was crouched beside me with his hand on my back. Percy, are you okay? He shook me gently, but I couldn't move. It was like my body was covered by the lead blanket they make you wear for an x-ray. Sam's voice was suddenly right in my ear. Percy? Percy? Let me know if you're okay. I turned my head to him and opened one eye. He was inches away, his face lined with worry. MMMM, I groaned. Need to lie here. Sam let out an enormous breath, and his expression transformed to glee. Percy, you did it. You actually did it. You were amazing. Words kept tumbling from his mouth, but I struggled to comprehend them. I felt delirious. I can't believe how you just kept going and going, with no breaks. You were like some kind of machine. He was wearing the most gigantic smile. Sam only seemed to get better and better looking, like he was growing into himself, and when he smiled like that, it was completely disarming. He is pretty. I found myself smiling at the realization. Did you just say that I'm pretty? Sam asked, laughing. Oh God, I must have said that bit out loud. You must really be out of it. He took off his shirt and lay down beside me with his lower half in the water, his hand on my back. He smelled like sun and sweat. I closed my eyes and inhaled deeply. I like how you smell, too, I whispered, but this time he didn't respond. After about five minutes or five hours, Sam announced that we should probably head back so no one worried. I slowly crawled to my hands and knees and, with Sam's help, made it into the boat on legs that wobbled as though they were filled with lake water jello, drink this, he ordered, passing me a blue Gatorade and wrapping a towel around me. Once I'd had a few gulps, a smile burst across his face again. I'm so proud of you, he said. Told you she was a swimmer, Charlie said to Sam as he pulled me out of the boat, giving my shoulder a squeeze. She really is, Sam replied. The smile seemed permanently attached to his face, so much bigger and more open than the lopsided half-grin he usually wore. There was an assembly line of hugs when I got out of the boat. First mom, you looked great out there, honey, then dad, didn't know you had it in you, kiddo, and finally Sue, who squeezed me tightest of all. I was an inch or so taller than her now, and she felt soft and small. She held onto my hands when we pulled away. You're an awesome kid, you know that. Her pale blue eyes crinkled at the corners. Let's get some food in you. I'm making breakfast. To this day, I don't think I've ever eaten as much bacon as I did that morning. My parents had gone back to the cottage, but Sue made enough food to feed ten people. She cooked Canadian and regular bacon, and the boys watched with fascinated stares as I dug into piece after piece, along with scrambled eggs, toast and fried tomato. At the end of the meal, Sue looked each of us in the eye, and said, I'm so impressed by each of you this summer. You're really growing up. Charlie, you've been such a help in the kitchen, and, Sam, I'm grateful that you're working with me now, too. I don't know what I'd do without my boys. She said this with total conviction, her voice steady despite the sentiment. You'd probably chain some other poor teenager to the dishwasher, Charlie replied. Sue laughed. Absolutely. Hard work is good for the soul. And, Percy, she continued, it takes a lot of dedication to do what you did today, not to mention winning that writing prize of yours. I'm as proud as if you were my own daughter. She patted my hand, then went back to eating her breakfast, as though she hadn't just given me the greatest compliment I'd ever received from a grown-up. When I looked over at Sam, he was beaming. It was the perfect end to summer. Hi Percy. 
I know Thanksgiving was just this weekend, still pretty grossed out by how Delilah drooled over Charlie, by the way, but guess what? Mom is going to let me take New Year's Eve off, so we can spend it hanging out. Sam. Sam. Delilah thinks Charlie is cute, but don't worry, she has a crush on her cousin's best friend. She's even forcing me to go on a double date with them, so she'll probably forget all about Charlie. Jealous. Mom found an old fondue set at a yard sale, and is doing a 70s-themed New Year's dinner. I hope you like melted cheese. Percy. Percy. What kind of terrible person doesn't like melted cheese? I don't like Delilah like that if that's what you mean. Have you met her cousin before? Sam. Sam. I haven't met Delilah's cousin yet. He's in 12th grade like Charlie, but he goes to a different school. His name is Buckley. But everyone calls him Mason because that's his last name, and I guess he doesn't like Buckley. Who would? Countdown to NYE is on. Percy. As promised, Emma M went all in for her 70s New Year's Eve. She made fondue and Caesar salad and the four of us sat on the floor near the fire dipping hunks of crusty bread into the yellow goo, listening to Joni Mitchell and Fleetwood Mac albums on the old record player of Dad's that Mom had repaired as a Christmas gift. This is actually a little gross, all of us putting our forks back into the cheese, I said, and Mom gave me a look. But it's so delicious, said Sam, waving a piece of drippy bread in my face. Couldn't agree with you more, Sam, Dad said, and plucked the bread from Sam's fork and then popped it into his mouth. Mom served carrot cake for dessert, and then we played poker with wooden matchsticks until Sam bankrupted us all. I'm not sure whether to be disturbed or impressed that a 15-year-old can keep such a straight face, my dad commented when he handed over the last of his matches to Sam. At midnight, Mom let Sam and me have a glass of champagne each, and the bubbles made my hands and face warm. Not long after, my parents made up the couch for Sam with sheets tucked around the cushions, poured the remaining champagne into our glasses, then went to bed. Sam and I sat facing each other on opposite ends of the couch, the quilt spread over our legs. I was bummed about going back to the city in two days' time and wanted to stay up all night talking. He tapped my leg with his foot under the blanket. Are you going to tell me about how your date with Buckley went? We hadn't discussed Delilah's cousin Mason since I first mentioned him in an email, hoping it would prompt Sam to confess his love. It didn't quite work out according to plan, and I figured Sam had forgotten all about it. The truth was that Delilah and I had been on a couple of double dates with Mason and his friend, Patel. Last names as first names seemed to be a thing in their circle, they both went to a boys private school not far from where I lived, and played on the same hockey team. I was surprised that Delilah would date someone as quiet and soft-spoken as Patel, but he had these huge brown eyes and an even bigger smile. I can tell he's deep, she explained when I asked her about it. Goalies are sexy, and I bet he's an amazing kisser. Mason was obsessed with hockey and building muscle for hockey and growing out his dark hair so it would curl just right from under his hockey helmet. He had blue eyes like Delilah and was gorgeous like Delilah, and I think he probably knew it like Delilah did, too, but he was actually a pretty nice guy. I just didn't think of him constantly like I did Sam. It's Mason, I corrected Sam. And there's not much to tell. Let's start with the basics. Do you like Buckley? He smirked. I kicked him. Then shrugged. He's okay. Just okay, huh? Sounds serious. After a moment, he asked, Don't you think he's a bit too old for you? He's turning 18 in a few weeks, and I'll be 16 in February. Besides, we've only been on two dates. You didn't tell me about the second one. Was I supposed to tell him about other boys? He didn't talk to me about girls. I didn't think you would care, and it's not like he's my boyfriend or anything, I said defensively. But he wants to be. 
it wasn't a question. I'm not sure. I don't think boys think of me like that. Like what, Percy? Was he teasing me? Or did he not know what I meant? My head was fuzzy with confusion and champagne. They're not interested in kissing me, I said, looking down at our legs. He tapped me with his foot again. That's not true. And for the record, I do care. Sam was right, Mason was interested. Delilah and I went to two of his and Patel's hockey games in January. We sat in the stands clutching foam cups of bad hot chocolate to keep our hands warm in the frigid arena. At each game, Mason waved to me from the ice before taking his position at right wing for the puck drop. I could see why he loved hockey, he was the best player on the team by far. Each time he scored, he'd look up to me in the stands with a big smile on his face. After the second game, Delilah and I waited for the guys outside the locker room so we could all go for a pizza. Mason came out, hair damp and smelling of shampoo, with a huge gym bag slung over his shoulder. He wore jeans and a tight long-sleeved crew neck that stretched over his chest and arms. He was even more muscular than Charlie, and I had to admit that he looked pretty hot. When Patel and Delilah walked ahead, Mason pulled me into a doorway, told me he thought I was pretty, and gave me a soft peck on the lips. I said, thank you, and smiled at him a little dazed, unsure of what came next or what he expected of me. I like how fresh you are, he laughed. Both Delilah and I were invited to Mason's 18th birthday party, which was being held at a swanky hotel in Yorkville at the end of the month, complete with a DJ, sushi bar, and a 120-person long guest list. Delilah had made sure that practically all the girls in our grade knew we were going, and we had been given the appropriate level of awed respect. The night of the party, we got ready at Delilah's, curling our hair with hot rollers and dabbing on mascara and lip gloss, but when I put on my dress, a slinky red floor-length gown Delilah said showed off my killer body, she let out a horrified, no way. You cannot wear those. What are you talking about? I looked down at my gold ballet flats, confused. Those granny panties. Have I taught you nothing? Don't you have a thong? I looked at her incredulously. Not on me. You're hopeless, she sighed, and flung the skimpiest pair of red underwear I had ever seen at me. I don't think my mom would be happy about these, I said, holding them up. Well, she wouldn't be happy about that panty line, either, believe me, said Delilah. I shimmied out of my underwear and slipped on the thong. Much better. Delilah said and gave my butt a squeeze. Mason won't be able to keep his hands off this. The thought made me jittery. Delilah's parents drove us to the hotel, slipped Delilah a fifty for a cab ride home, and left us at the coat check to mingle. I didn't think there'd be so many grown-ups here, I whispered to Delilah, looking around the ballroom more than half the guests were middle-aged or older. My uncle is kind of a big deal on Bay Street. Something to do with the stock market, she hissed back. We danced together with some of the older girls while the boys watched from slip-covered chairs. At 8 p.m., Mason's dad, a tall, soft-looking white-haired man, who Delilah said was almost done with wife number two, gave a toast to his son, and then, to gasps from the crowd, threw him a set of keys. We all shuffled outside, huddling against the cold, where Mason's new Audi was parked at the entrance. I'll take it home for you tonight, his dad told him with a wink and slipped him a flask. In less than twenty minutes, the remaining adults had all snuck away. When the telltale pan flute of a Celine Dion ballad warbled over the speakers, Mason pointed at me, then himself with a smile. I walked over and he put his hands around my waist while I rested mine on the shoulders of his black suit jacket. We swayed back and forth, shuffling around in a circle, and Mason leaned down, pressing his mouth up to my ear. You look beautiful tonight, Percy. I looked up at his eyes, which were blue but a darker, muddier blue than Sam's, and he pulled me flush against his body so that my cheek rested at the top of his chest. I can't stop thinking of you, 
he whispered. After the song finished, he pulled me out to the hallway, where Delilah, Patel, three other boys, and an older girl joined us. One of the guys, who introduced himself as Daniels, flashed us a bottle of what he said was vodka from under his suit jacket. Shall we relocate the festivities, he said, wiggling his eyebrows and putting his arm around the girl, who was called Ashley. The boys all had rooms upstairs, and we congregated in the living area of Mason and Patel's suite. Daniel sat in an armchair with Ashley on his lap, Delilah and Patel took the sofa, and the two guys sat on the floor, leaving a chair for Mason and me. I perched on the side, but Mason pulled me onto his lap and put an arm around me, resting it on my hip. Daniels passed each of us a glass of vodka and ice. It smelled like nail polish remover and burned my lips even before I took a tiny sip. Don't drink it if you don't like it, Mason whispered in my ear so no one could hear, and I smiled gratefully at him, then poured mine into his glass. Works for me. He smiled back. His thumb moved back and forth on my hip while the group talked about his new car and hockey season. It was pretty tame, considering we were a group of unsupervised teens with a bottle of alcohol, and I noticed that, other than Daniels, who was needing Ashley's but like pizza dough, no one had a refill. By eleven, the others left for their rooms, and Delilah and I stood to get our coats on. Before you leave, Percy, there's something I want to show you, Mason said running his hands through his hair and sounding a little nervous. Yeah, I bet, Patel muttered, and Delilah whacked him in the arm. Mason led me down a short hall to a sleek-looking bedroom, all topes and browns, with a king-sized bed and suede headboard. He closed the door behind us and slid the closet open, knelt down, and punched a number into a small safe. When he stood, he was holding a little turquoise box. What's this? I asked. It's not my birthday. I know, he said, moving closer. I was going to save it for your 16th, but I couldn't wait. Open it. His eyes moved expectantly over my face. I lifted off the lid to find a turquoise velvet pouch. Inside was a silver bracelet with a chunky, modern clasp. I was thinking you might want to be my girlfriend he said and smiled, and that maybe you needed something a little more special than this. He held up the arm that wore my friendship bracelet. I had not seen this coming. It's gorgeous, um, wow. I'm not sure what to say. I stammered. Mason fastened the bracelet around my wrist. You can think about it, but I want you to know that I really like you. He put his hands on my hips and pulled me toward him then brought his lips down onto mine. They were soft as he moved them gently over my mouth. He pulled back enough to look into my eyes and said, you're so smart and funny and so beautiful and you don't even know it. He kissed me again, harder this time, and I closed my eyes. Images of Sam flashed through my mind, and when Mason ran his tongue over the seam of my lips, my knees felt as though they might buckle, and I grasped his biceps. He placed a string of light kisses on the corner of my mouth, then my nose, and then back on my mouth, and ran his tongue over my lips again. This time I opened to him, and I imagined it was Sam's tongue swirling with my own. Mason groaned and moved his hands down to my backside, pressing himself against my hip. I pulled away. I should go, we'll be late back to Delilah's. Mason didn't protest just ran his hands up my back and gave me another quick kiss, then took my hand in his. Next to my embroidered bracelet, the silver one looked garish, and I took it off before mom picked me up the next morning so she wouldn't ask questions. Delilah was surprised by the gift, which she called excessive, but she didn't think it meant that Mason wanted to make things more official. Of course he likes you, Percy. You're a catch. And your tits have really come in this year, she said in a stage whisper. Keep things light with Mason. I can tell you don't like him the way you like your summer boy, but maybe you can just think of it as practice if Sam ever comes around. I emailed Sam as soon I got home. Hi Sam. I've been thinking about my new story more. 
What do you think about a lake that's haunted by a young girl who fell through the ice in the winter, leaving her twin sister behind? When the sister is a teenager, she comes back to the lake on a camping trip and she sees a strange figure in the woods, which will turn out to be her dead twin who's trying to kill her so she won't be alone. It could be scary and maybe a little sad. Thoughts? Also, Delilah and I went to Mason's birthday party last night, and he asked me to be his girlfriend. I know you won't be surprised since you guessed that at New Year's, but I was. What do you think I should do? Percy. Percy. I still think a lake full of zombie fish is the way to go. Just kidding. Creepy dead girl is definitely the best idea yet. Are you going to give the sisters obnoxious twin names, like Lila and Layla, or Jessica and Bessica? I asked you this before, but I think it's time to ask again, do you like Buckley? Sam. Sam. Why hadn't I thought of Jessica and Bessica before? Genius. Mason's actually a nice guy, but I like someone else more. Percy. Percy. I think you have your answer. Sam. 9. Now. We sit in the truck staring at Tietchi Florex house. Or at least I stare at the house. Sam is watching me. It looks amazing, I say. And it does. The lawns are green and mowed, the flower beds are blooming and tidy, and the siding and trim on the house are freshly painted. The basketball net still hangs on the garage. There are terracotta pots of happy red geraniums on the porch, Sam probably planted them himself. The thought makes me squishy. Thanks, Sam says. I've been trying to keep it up. Mom would hate to see her gardens taken over by weeds. He pauses, then adds, but it's also been a good distraction from everything. How have you been managing all this on top of the restaurant and work? I ask, turning to face him and waving my hand at the house. It's a huge property for one person to maintain. God, how did Sue do it? And raise two kids and run the tavern? Sam runs a hand over his smooth cheek. Shaving only made his cheekbones more prominent, his jaw more angled. I guess I don't sleep much, he says. Don't look so horrified. I got used to staying up for long stretches when I was a resident. Anyway, I'm grateful I've had something to do. I would have gone crazy sitting around the past year. Guilt curls around my heart. I hate that he did this alone. Without me. Does Charlie help much? Nah. He offered to come back, but he's busy in Toronto. I cock my head, not following. He works in finance, on Bay Street, Sam explains. He was up for a big promotion, I told him to stay in the city. I had no idea, I murmur. I guess his boss has better luck getting him to wear a shirt than your mom did. Sam chuckles. Pretty sure he wears a suit and everything. I clear my throat and ask the question I've been wondering all morning, and Taylor. She lives in Kingston. Yeah, her firm is there. She's not exactly a Barry's Bay girl. Didn't notice, I mutter, looking out the window. I can see Sam smile from the corner of my eye before he gets out of the truck and walks around to my side. Opening the door, he offers me a hand to hop down. I know how to get out of a truck, you know? I say, taking his hand anyway. Well, you've been gone a long time, city slicker. He grins while I get out. He's got one arm on the door of the truck and the other on the side, caging me with his body. His face turns serious. Charlie should be home later, he says, eyeing me closely. He went into the restaurant this morning to help Julian with a few last-minute things for tomorrow. It'll be great to see him again, I say with a smile, but my mouth has gone dry. And Julian. He's still there, huh? Julian Chen was the long-suffering chef at the tavern. He was terse and funny and kind of like a big brother to Sam and Charlie. Julian's still there. 
He's been a big help to me and mom. He took her to chemo when I had shifts at the hospital, and when she was in there for the last few months, he stayed with her almost as much as I did. He's taking it pretty hard. I can imagine, I say. Do you ever think he and your mom, you know? The idea hadn't crossed my mind as a teen, but as I got older, I thought it might explain why a young, single man whose cooking skills far surpassed boiling pierages and cooking sausages would live in a small town for so long. I don't know. He runs his hand through his hair. I always wondered why he stuck around for so long. He didn't plan on spending his life up here, it was just a summer job for him. I think he had big dreams of opening his own place in the city. Mom said he stayed for me and Charlie. The last couple of years, though, I wondered if it was for her. He looks back down to me with a sad smile, and without saying a word, we both walk around the side of the house and head to the water. It feels instinctive, like I had walked down this hill only days ago rather than more than a decade earlier. The old rowboat is tied to one side of the dock, a new motor attached to the stern, and the raft floats out from the dock just as it used to. My throat is thick, but my whole body relaxes at the view. I close my eyes when we get to the dock and breathe. We haven't put the banana boat in this year, Sam says, and my eyes pop open. You still have it. I marvel. In the garage. Sam smiles, a flash of white teeth and soft lips. We walk out to the end of the dock and I steady myself before looking down the shore. There's a white speedboat attached to a new, larger dock where ours used to be. Your cottage looks pretty much the same from the water, Sam says. But they've put another room on the back. It's a family of four, the kids are probably eight and ten by now. We let them swim over and use the raft. I have an odd sensation looking out over the water and the raft and the far shore, it's all so familiar, like I'm watching an old family video except the people have been scrubbed out so I can only make out faint silhouettes where they once were. I long for those people and the girl I used to be. Percy? I don't hear Sam until he puts a hand on my shoulder. He's looking at me funny and I realize a few tears have managed to sneak out of their holding cells. I wipe them away and try to smile. Sorry. I feel like I was just transported back in time for a second. I get that. Sam is quiet and then crosses his arms across his chest. Speaking of going back in time, think you could still do it. He nods to the other side of the lake. Swim across? I scoff. That's what I thought. Too old and out of shape for it now, he says with a tart. Are you screwing with me? Sam's mouth ticks up on one side. You brought me here to insult my age and my body. That's low, even for you, Dr. Florek. The other side of his mouth moves upward. Your body looks good from where I'm standing, Sam says, looking me up and down. Perv. I unsuccessfully fight back a grin. You sound like your brother. My eyes go wide at what I've just said, but he doesn't seem to notice. It's been a long time, he continues. I'm just saying we aren't as spry as we used to be. Spry? Who says spry? What are you, seven to five years old? I tease. And speak for yourself, old man. I am plenty spry. Not all of us have gone soft. I poke his stomach, which is so hard it's like negative percent body fat. He smacks at me. I narrow my eyes, then study the far shore. Let's say I do it, swim across the lake. What's in it for me? Other than bragging rights? Hem. He rubs his chin, and I stare at the tendon snaking along in his forearm. I'll give you a present. A present? A good one. You know I'm an excellent present giver. It's true, Sam used to give the best gifts. Once, he mailed me a worn copy of Stephen King's memoir, on writing. It wasn't a special occasion, but he'd wrapped it up and left a note on the inside cover, found this at the second-hand store. I think it was waiting for you. 
Humble as always, Sam. Any idea what this excellent gift will be? None whatsoever. I can't help the laugh that bubbles out of me or the big grin across my face. Well, in that case, I say, unbuttoning my shorts, how could I refuse? Sam gapes at me. He didn't think I'd do it. You better still know how to row. I lift my shirt over my head and stand with my hands on my hips. Sam's mouth is still hanging open, and while my two-piece is hardly skimpy, I suddenly feel extremely exposed. I have no issues with my body. Okay, yes, I have plenty of issues, but I recognize them as insecurities and don't tend to worry too much about my soft belly or bumpy thighs. My relationship with my body is one of the few healthy ones I have. I go to a regular spin class and do a weight circuit a couple of times a week, but it's mostly because I can manage my stress better when I exercise. I'm by no means as toned as the insufferable women who do spinning in short shorts and sports bras, but that's not the goal. I'm fightish, there are just some jiggles in places I like to think are fine to be a bit jiggly. Sam's gaze runs down to my chest and back to my face. I can row, he says, a suspicious glimmer in his eye. He pulls his t-shirt over his head and drops it on the dock. Now I'm the one gaping. Are you serious? I squawk, flailing at his torso, my verbal filter completely removed. Eighteen-year-old Sam was in great shape, but adult Sam has a freaking six-pack. His skin is golden and so is the hair that dusts his broad chest. It gets darker as it forms a line from his belly button to below his jeans. His shoulders and arms are muscular but not in a weirdly thick way. Sam bends over to take off his socks and sneakers, then rolls up his jeans so his ankles and the bottoms of his calves are bare. I know, I've gone soft, he says, his blue eyes glittering like sun on water. I give him my most unimpressed look. I'm not sure the shirtlessness is necessary. It's sunny out. It's going to be hot in the boat. He shrugs. Your trouble. I scowl. I'm going to assume those aren't just decorative, I motion at his arms, and that you'll be able to keep up with me. I'll do my best, he says and steps into the boat. I roll my shoulders and then circle my arms to loosen them up. What the hell am I doing? It's not like I've kept up with swimming. Sam pushes off from the dock, turns the boat with the oars so the bow is facing the far shore, and waits for me to dive in. I stand at the edge of the dock watching him, his bare feet propped on the bench in front of him. I look at the water in front of me, then back at him. I'm not sure if it's deja vu that hits me or the weight of standing in this very spot while Sam drifts in that very boat, but my hands are shaking. How old are we? I call out. It takes him a moment to respond. Fifteen. I study the rocky beach at the other side of the lake. Adrenaline surges under my skin. I take a deep breath through my nose, then dive in. A sob vibrates through me as I swim under the cool water. If I'm crying when I surface, I have no idea, and I start swimming slowly. I can see the edge of the boat when I tilt my head for air, and I try to concentrate on how Sam is back beside me and not all the years he wasn't. It doesn't take long before my shoulders are tight with knots and my legs begin to burn, but I keep kicking and slicing my arms through the water. I'm in a mindless rhythm when a cramp seizes my big toe. I slow down and try curling it up to ease the muscle, but an agonizing pain shoots up my calf. I try to keep kicking but the spasm gets worse, and I have to stop swimming. I grit my teeth trying to tread water and yelp when the cramp doesn't release. I can barely hear Sam shouting until I see the side of the boat right next to me. Are you okay? He looks panicked. I shake my head, and then I feel his hands under my armpits, hauling me out of the water. My stomach scrapes on the side of the boat as he pulls me in, hands at my waist and then under my butt. I fall on top of him in a sopping pile of limbs. I'm lying with my head on his bare chest, trying to catch my breath. The pain subsides if I stay still, but when I wiggle my toe, it shoots through my leg again, and I hiss. 
Only then am I aware of Sam's hands, which tighten on my hips. I'm fully pressed to him, my forehead, my nose, my chest, my stomach, all I want to do is run my tongue across his warm chest and roll my hips against his jeans to relieve what's happening between my thighs. It's totally inappropriate, considering the amount of pain I'm in. You okay, Percy? His voice is strained. Cramp, I breathe into his chest. In my toe and calf. Hurts to move. Which leg? Left. I feel Sam's hand move down my thigh to my calf to the muscle. Goosebumps radiate from under his fingers, and a shudder runs through me. He pauses for a second, and I lift my head to look at him. His eyes are dark and unblinking. Sorry, I whisper. He shakes his head so slightly it's almost imperceptible. It helps to relax the muscle, he says and wraps his whole hand over my calf, applying pressure, then moving in slow circles, kneading gently. My heart is beating so fiercely I wonder if he can feel it, too. I shut my eyes and involuntarily squeeze my thighs together. He must feel the movement because his left hand increases its grip on my hip. I can feel his breath on my forehead. Better. The question comes out in a rasp. I shift my leg slightly, and it does feel better. Yeah. I push myself up, but now I'm straddling him awkwardly on the floor of the boat. His chest is slick with the water. I start brushing it off, but he puts his hand around my wrist. He's looking up at me, eyelids heavy. Your trouble, he says, echoing my words from earlier. The air between us pulls tight like a rubber band. I take a deep breath, and Sam's gaze follows the rise of my chest, and yep, my nipples are obscene under my top. To be fair, I'm cold and wet. Sam swallows and meets my eyes again. I've seen this look from him before, stormy and focused and completely consuming, like I could fall into his eyes and never get out. His fingers move slightly at the back of my hip, just under the edge of my bathing suit. His other hand runs up and down the back of my thigh. What is happening? Taylor, I think. Sam has Taylor. Sam's hand leaves my thigh and he rubs his thumb over the creases between my eyes, smoothing out the frown lines, then runs it down over my cheek, cupping my face. You're still the most beautiful woman I've ever known, he says, and it sounds like coarse sandpaper. I blink at him. His words are confusing and wonderful, and I feel a little high and a lot turned on. But I know we shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't want this. He traces my lips with his thumb, and the fingers of his other hand dig more deeply into the flesh at the back of my hip. This is a bad idea. I choke the words out. His eyes move rapidly across my face, and he sits up beneath me so that I'm on his lap. He rests his forehead on mine and closes his eyes, taking shallow breaths. Is he shaking? I think he's shaking. I move my hands to his shoulders and rub them up and down his arms. Hey, it's okay. Old habits, right? I say, trying to lighten the mood, but my heart is screaming at me. Why don't we head back and have a swim to cool off, I say, looking around, seeing now that I hadn't even made it halfway across the lake. When I look back to Sam, his jaw is clenched as though he's trying to decide something, but he only says, yeah, okay. Sam heads UP to the house to change when we get back from our very short, very quiet boat ride. I had gotten a quick glimpse of my cottage from the water, a flashback of my parents sitting on the deck with cold glasses of wine. Now I sit at the edge of the dock waiting for Sam with my feet in the water, replaying what just happened, lingering on the moment when his fingers slipped under my suit. My hips still tingle where his hands gripped them. I once wanted Sam in every way I could of him, that hasn't changed. And if he had kept going, I would have, too. I'm ashamed by that truth, but it is the truth. I know myself. My self-control is on ice when I'm around him. I wonder if that would be a good premise for a book, a woman with no self-control. I smile to myself I haven't daydreamed about stories in a long time. I hear Sam's footsteps behind me, 
and I look over my shoulder. He's wearing a pair of coral-colored swim trunks that look amazing against his tan skin and holding a pair of towels and a water bottle. What are you thinking about? He puts the towels down and sits beside me, his shoulder touching mine, and passes me the bottle. Just an idea for a story. You still write like that? No, I admit. I don't really write at all. You should, he says gently, after a moment. You are really good. I'm pretty sure I still have an autographed copy of Young Blood in the desk drawer of my old bedroom. I look at him wide-eyed. You don't. Yeah. Actually, I know I do. It holds up. He must see the question written on my face, because he answers it without me asking. I've been staying in my old room for a year, I went through my things a while back. I can't believe you still have it. I don't think I even have a copy anymore, I say with disbelief. Well, you can't have mine. He grins. It's dedicated to me, if you'll remember. Of course, I murmur as my mind drifts into nostalgia. I wish Sue were here. She would have got a kick out of watching 30-year-old me attempt to swim across the lake without any training. The question leaves my throat as soon as it enters my head, did your mom hate me? I turn to Sam and watch him puzzle out how to answer. He's silent for a long moment. No, she didn't hate you, Percy, he says finally. She was concerned that we stopped speaking so suddenly. She asked a lot of questions, some of them I had answers for, and others I didn't. And, I don't know, I think she was hurt, too. His blue eyes fix on me. She loved you. You are family. I press my lips together, hard, and tilt my face skyward. This is the moment, I think. This is the moment where I tell him. But then Sam speaks again. I don't, either, by the way. You don't what? I ask, looking at him. I don't hate you, he says simply. I hadn't known how badly I needed to hear those words until they left his lips. My bottom lip begins to tremble and I bite down on it, concentrating on the sharpness of my teeth. My courage has vanished. I'm as brittle as dry straw. Thanks, I say when I'm certain my voice won't break. Sam bumps me gently with his shoulder. Shall we? He slants his head toward the raft. Maybe we can get some more freckles on that nose of yours. I exhale a nervous laugh. He stands up first, then holds out a hand, pulling me up. I would apologize in advance, Percy, but I know I won't be sorry, he says with a smirk, and before I can ask what the hell he means, he picks me up like a sack of flour, and tosses me into the water. Thanks for listening and reading, visit list-read.com to read the rest.